Spencer. Spencer. Head nod of acknowledgement. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We have a stacked roster of uh, Discovery fans and a stacked amount of content to cover, so we're just going to dive right into it. You all know who everyone is. They've been on multiple times. We're here to talk about Star Trek. Cranky. <laughs> Thank you, Cranky. Well, one month subscribe for every year he's been on this planet. Thank you, Cranky. Um <laughs> <laughs> so yeah discovery just wrapped we talked in depth about season five last week so you can find that on our channel uh we're going to take a broader approach today talking about everything and we're going to start right back at the beginning so if you guys can jump in the way back machine go back to 2016 as i was reminded today when we first saw our uh, promotional material for star trek discovery let's go around the horn what did you guys think what were you expecting we had a bit of a layoff after enterprise I personally thought we may never get Trek again, um, So, but we got the movies and then Discovery popped up. So what were your early memories and what were you expecting? And Idol, since I'm doing hosting duties so that you can uh, uh, expand on everything, go ahead, kick us off. So yeah, the, for, for people that don't remember, the very first teaser trailer was that shot of the Discovery coming out of the space dock, a very sort of quick and dirty render by the looks of things, but it was sort of an early design of Discovery. And there, there were mixed reactions. And my first thought when I saw it was like, wow they actually did the ralph Macquarie uh design and they're actually going with it i thought that's very cool and it was a clunky design and i think it wasn't until you know i think it wasn't until about season t late season two and three i thought actually no i really like the discovery design like in motion it was a lot better but yeah that first that first sort of uh first sort of promo wasn't it was a bit of a nothing one it was more like here's the hype for our ship and there's no actually mm -hmm. indication of what they're doing but they called it star trek discovery which is a cool name they called it you know they showed a, a, a concept design and it was a return to trek so i was very excited i was very excited to see where this show would go back in back in 2016 in that first trailer i remember clearly I yeah i remember clearly uh because it was pay gated and so i wasn't able to uh, to adopt discovery uh for, for oh, years yeah. Um, yeah, so the Par Paramount, uh, at the time, I think it was just Paramount Stream. I forget what it was called. It wasn't Paramount CBS Plus. CBS yeah. All Access. That's right, CBS right. All Access. Wow. Thank you. That's what it was. Yep. Ooh. Yeah, it was just, uh, so we, we we were still, this is around about the time that Netflix was transitioning off of mailing you DVDs. And uh, so every everybody in the Red world could watch, could watch everything in the world on Netflix. And so, and that included uh, Classic Trek. And so for for years, you know, I, I kind of placated myself with that and thought to myself, you know, I, so this is a strange time, right? Because we've become much more comfortable with paying for streaming services. And many of us have multiples um, for all the different addictions that we have. And so early on, it, it really just kind of irked me that I was being asked to pay for more. And over time, I, I see in retrospect the, the wisdom of that. And, you know, this is not outside of the realm of the era of... Uh, people doing uh, what, what is it called when you when you buy advance and then they eventually deliver the content to you or you, you go fund me's I guess right mm -hmm. so that that was it's around at the time yeah. Kickstarter is what I'm thinking of right that's exactly it so so I mean it's really just an early version of that and now we're very comfortable buying entire seasons from Mystery Science Theater 3000 did it and there's other shows that are completely funded by that and so this is just you know similar to that model but it really soured my taste for a while so it took a while for me to come around to it I'm, I'm a late discovery adopter uh, because of that but the, you know didn't have an early experience because i couldn't get to it it's interesting you mentioned that and it, 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 it's <coughs> remarkable actually within the seven years that the show's beyond how things have changed you're right i remember there being a lot of pushback for people saying oh it's only on cbs all access i'm not going to do it it's only on paid streaming and it was a uh, people were a lot more hostile to that back then like mm. you say it's easier yeah. now but um from our perspective mine and uh, stars and cranky's perspective we had it on netflix because netflix bought yeah. the european rights it was so. really easy yeah, cause yeah. They had a full distribution mm. partnership where it was a case of discovery season one and two and i think mm -hmm. maybe for part of season three you could just yeah. watch it as part of netflix it was just on netflix you didn't have yeah. cbs all access over here and then we were blighted with paramount plus mm. 
the, their big error was airing the first half of the pilot on broadcast CBS here, oh, yeah. and then putting the second episode behind a paywall mm. when they <laughs> premiered. Like that—that that was just a. Well, see, I think the thought behind that was they wanted Nielsen ratings out so that nerds could argue about half an episode for the next six years Mm. as to whether or not Discovery was a success. So I think that's why they put it on network TV. Yeah. I mean, even Uh, my my first. Oh, sorry. Even even Chakotay, the um, the Star Trek script website that we've used loads and loads of times still doesn't put scripts up for things that are on streaming titles. You know, it's still an issue today. So, yeah, take one. Sorry, shall I go on? Interesting. I was just saying, my my first uh, encounter with that teaser trailer was at the first and only uh, n- official Star Trek New York uh, convention, Star Trek Destination New York, uh, where they had a huge panel. They had all the casts. They had TNG. Wow. They had DS9. They they pulled out all the stops for this convention that they scheduled the same weekend as Dragon Con in Atlanta for some reason, um, and it was very sparsely attended. Oh, no. uh, but there was a discovery panel, a preview discovery panel with with uh, the producers and Nicholas Meyer was there, and they they talked about it and they played the teaser, and it was super exciting for all of us at that point. Um, but they had very little material to show us uh, at that point, and I think they had been hoping that because it was the I believe it was the 50th anniversary at that point of the franchise, or 2016. Is that? Uh, yeah. I could... Yeah, it would yeah, right. be. Yeah, yeah it would actually. That, yeah. that, that they would have had the series out by that That's fall, right, yeah. and it'll be not till the mm-hmm. till the next year. So, uh, I was very excited for Discovery, and I, yeah, we'll talk more about that later. That was my my first exposure to. <laughs> oh, <laughs> has subscribed. And 19 months, nice. Yeah, I waited until metal Shy metal finished his thought before I, before I hit the button. So. so polite of you, you'll never get that return. Um, so for me, I was 22 at the time. I had just gotten my first job. Um, so like, I'm trying to put myself back in that kind of time like, time space. And I remember seeing that like first discovery, I think it was um, when it got uploaded onto YouTube, because guess what they inevitably do. Um, I was like, oh, that looks kind of cool. And then I was just like, kind of watching it. And I remember at the time, what really got me excited was that I was like, I wasn't quite the Star Trek nerd I am now back then. I was more into Doctor Who at the time, and then I kind of fell off of that. Um, was um, the attachment of Brian Fuller to the project, because I yes. love Brian Fuller. I really enjoyed um, NBC's Hannibal. I really enjoyed Pushing Daisies. Like, Pushing Daisies is one of my favorite shows of, like, the last 20 years, I'd say. So, like, the idea of, oh, he's going to do a, a, a Star Trek show is really, really cool. Um, and then that didn't last. That didn't last, like, mm-hmm. almost at all. Um... But at, yeah, even still, I, I was you know, cautiously optimistic. Like you know, at that point, you know, twenty sixteen. What's the last Star Trek thing I, I would have watched? I would have watched Into Darkness. Would have been Ooh. the last Star Trek project, or and beyond, then Beyond, beyond was twenty sixteen. Yeah. I, I I didn't watch Beyond for like two or three years precisely oh, okay. because of how bad Into Darkness was. <laughs> yeah, it was just, yeah. Like Too bad. I remember not wanting to go and see Into Darkness because I'd been spoiled on what happened. And then I went to see it, and I was just sitting there watching Zachary Quinto scream, and I was like, "You need to, buddy. You need to." <laughs> um, and that put me off it. I was just like, "Well, I'll give the show a bit of a go." Um, and then obviously, it was a lot easier to watch it over in the UK because it was on Netflix. Um, and I remember watching it with my friend Michael, and I think it was during like the little, little speech where um, Saru gives to Burnham in that pilot about like you know, what it's like on Kaminar, about you know, sensing the coming of death, and he just kind of turned to me and said, Star Trek's kind of back, in a way. Um, and I was like, yeah, in a way. And I, I had no idea what was going to come. Like This was before the announcement of Picard. Um, this was a nap before Strange New Worlds was a thing, like even the fledgling in someone's eye, before Lower Decks, before Prodigy. And it's like, it's weird to think now, when we've had so much Star Trek, that back then, Discovery was it, and you had to... You had no idea what it was going to be like. You had to really mm. just kind of Hold fast to see what's going to go. See, my experience is very slightly different. I think I'm the exception of the to the rule with you guys because mm. I tend not to watch trailers. I'll read a little bit about things and then I want to find out mm. for myself when the show's on. I, I I avoid trailers if I can, generally speaking. Um, but I was super excited for the show. I about 2011, 2012. I got back into Star Trek in quite a big way. Ran through all of the shows start to finish i would got a friend of mine 
into it quite big and then the announcement came out about Discovery and it was like yeah, there's going to be more it's going to happen again there's going to be more Star Trek but yeah I didn't I, I, I'm pretty sure I avoided as many trailers as I could and just went straight in for the show so as long as we're in the Wayback Machine, I want to get your thoughts also on uh, the serialization format, because that was, I mean, DS9 dabbled in it, and then actually for extended periods in the later seasons. Um, but they punctuated it a lot with standalone episodes and, you know, your classic TOS. Most of the series, in fact, were almost strictly episodic with very little carry through. So when you heard that it was going to um, going to come out, and then even looking looking back now, do you think that was the right decision? Was that something you were looking forward to them trying? How do you think it turned out? I think that's... I yeah, think it, for, sorry, go on, Dan. You first, please. I was going to say, I, was, I think it was very forward-thinking. So streaming, again, was, was relatively new. And to have a, a, a streaming-exclusive series like that was also very new, really really cutting edge and it, uh, fitting of Trek, right? But um, but to, to know that you're going to have a, a much shorter season. So the things that happen in episode one, you can actually pay off eight, you know, even 10 episodes later, knowing that it's a, a condensed time frame. Also, these are going to release not over the course of six months, but just, you know, even just six or 10 weeks. So it's going to be, uh, you know, something that's fresh in people's minds and they can actually follow along. So interesting, you mentioned Doctor Who. There, there was a, a problem with, uh, with, with Colin Baker's Doctor, the, the original series with... Uh, the trial of the time lord where it, it got released over a very long period of time and people just didn't remember things that they were mentioning you know 12 episodes mm -hmm. after and and so it, you know it's it that that's always you know been a burden to, to series that really want to have this long format um, but it was the time it was the right time for it and that's one thing that it did well but we'll we'll get into that later uh sorry uh, idle no, back fine. to you <laughs> so yeah i mean like you know from my perspective like i'd been you know bottle fed on ds9 serialized storytelling going wow this is something cool and then graduated during literally graduating from university when battlestar galactica was on and that's very much sort of set the bar in a lot of shows that went on after that for what serialization was and you know a lot of the fan commentary say oh you know it's just another grimdank battlestar clone it kind of is but it kind of isn't in its own way it's sort of that with trek and it is serialized and you're right dan you know it was a bold thing to do considering like a lot of star trek fans wanted more of the same and still do and they kind of get it and they kind of don't um and i think discovery was at the time a risk doing what it was doing because it could have folded very much into the same kind of stuff that it always had done um the risk but then the risk would have been the berman and braga era of stagnation that happened during enterprise that led to kind of the cancellation so they kind of had to you know set a new mold for a new age really yeah, I for me, they... the, the suit... Oh, there you go. No, absolutely. You go, sirs. I, I want to hear from um... Idol again, actually. I was just going... <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> I'm going to new, so let me just time. repeat what I said now. Actually, I go <laughs> say, say it better this time. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm giving you a oh, second. It's impossible for him. It's impossible for him to say any better. Um, <laughs> you can take that however you like. Um, so for me... <laughs> like I, I, I guess so. One of my first experiences of like uh, serialized television was again Doctor Who because like that was like 2005. I would have been, oh my god, I would have been nine years old. So yeah. And I remember watching it from episode one to thirteen because that was the standard format of one of thirteen episodes. You should watch it all the way through. Wife in 2005. Sorry. And, <laughs> oh wow. Wait, you were nine <laughs> for freaking sake. I'm sorry, man. That's the way the cookie crumbles. <laughs> Um, and I remember just watching Chris Roxon go from episode one all the way and then regenerating at the end of the season and that was my first experience of a full serialized story albeit with you know episodic breaks in here and there um, and that's what television is now like mm. having gone back and watched TNG and DS9 and Voyager and Enterprise you know kind of after that you know, when I had access to my own streaming services and I could watch whatever I wanted I have an appreciation for the 26th episode season for this is a completely pointless episode that's just a ton of fun that's just focused on like you know, quote unquote filler but it's actually character development or just like let's do an interesting alien species and you can't really do that anymore like budgets are such that you can't really do that anymore people's attention spans are not so much that anymore I don't really think that the infrastructure really supports doing that anymore people's expectations are just like in a post game of thrones world especially can you really get away with doing i don't really think, think you can i think it's interesting and that's why every C yeah sorry mm -hmm. the cw uh, oh, yeah. infamous for flash and arrow and things yeah. like that do do oh, like God, 26 yeah. yeah they okay your quality varies from them yeah I, but they aren't no they aren't but good. if <laughs> no well yeah, yes and no but you know 
let another argument for another day but there is you know there is scope and there are productions that are still doing 26 episode series and i i I think that you know strange new worlds did cater for that audience that wanted that pretty pretty well it definitely silenced a lot of the critics and that on that side of things yeah i think there is a degree of like you like you you can vary the format and and the formula like obviously discovery is on the harder end of serialization strange new worlds is like kind of on the opposite and then you got like lower decks and prodigy somewhere over here and Mm -hmm. Picard somewhere close to discovery you can vary it up but i think that if you legitimately went for this is a collection of 10 episodes that kind of have nothing to do with each other which is like you know what like a lot of tng back in the day was like i don't feel like that would fly as much people want consistent character development people want consistent story arcs people like following that and they like speculation like if you think about you know the the, the lovely little um trailers that we get at the uh at the beginning of our trek tracks like, next time on star trek it's like <laughs> you, nine times out of ten you know, in fact 90 times out of 100 you're not watching the continuation of a story it's a completely different story that has no bearing on what happened before or what happened next episode mm. It's just a case of tune in next week and see what happens. It's like I have, it probably I think I won't have, matter I nine times looked, out of ten. I have looked for something recently because you know there is the the old adage that I used to do where I used to just put on TNG or on a random playlist. We used to do it to go to sleep mm. and I'd find find something. It would come up. I go, yeah, that'll do. I'll watch that, and I wouldn't have to pick up anything. Like there is an element of you know missing some point part of mm. that in modern television like i don't re-watch a lot of shows that i used to like you know all the star wars shows mm. that come out i haven't re or any of the marvel mm. ones because i haven't re-watched a single one because i'd have i have to watch the whole series not just an episode and that's kind of harder to do these yeah. days. not criticizing either way but just sort of saying from my own point of view that like there is an aspect to both i'm gonna let shy no, go true. i'm gonna let shy go but i have one thing to say that that new life and new civilizations is the value promise of star trek and originally it's why i think people really tuned in is to see something different a new costume a new monster each week mm. you know that was mm. that was the comic book mentality that here's a, a new adventure we don't want to see more development more of the same it was in in that 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 has changed over time you're right so i just wanted to throw that out there that <laughs> in its infancy that's that's i think what people tuned in for and that's changed over time mm. Well, I don't think I don't think those are mutually exclusive. Having a master arc season doesn't mean you can't introduce new species, new worlds, uh, new frontiers. It's, it's just you just have to integrate it into the writing and balance it out with character development. I know some people were complaining when Strange New Worlds came out because they were trying to rebalance it more towards episodic, but still maintain an arc story. That they were a little sad that there wasn't as much character development, and that's the that's the give and take. Um, you know, it's interesting when you said the problem with Colin Baker. I thought you were going to say his outfit, but <laughs> you were talking about the technical. The man's a style icon. I won't hear a word against. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, I think Discovery had no choice but to go with the arc format. That you know, you're coming off of 15, 16 years of The Sopranos, uh, The mm-hmm. Wire, Mad Men. Uh, that's just the the evolution of television in the prestige format, and. and uh, for Star Trek to just ignore that would have been, you know, very, it would have been poorly aged the day it debuted. I mean, even Enterprise in its final season was playing around with three episode arcs of stories, like two, three episode arcs. Well, see, season, season three of final. Enterprise was essentially one big arc, wasn't it? It was the, the Zindi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they did the Zindi story in the in the third season, which, you know, hit and missed, uh, depending on, on your... Uh, you know your mileage may vary there and then the the third season they did these little like mm. mini arcs and discovery kind of like went in between those two right like they have two the season the first season is split into two like semi arcs yeah. right the the, the yeah. klingon war and then the the magnificent terran <laughs> mirror, <laughs> mirror universe section uh mm. and then they come back to uh the, the remnants of the klingon war so but um yeah i i I loved it. I thought it was great. Yeah, same. I like I like the uh, the whole season length <laughs> arc. I, I'm not I, see Strange New Worlds. Obviously, they've gone for the episodic style, and it it put me off a little bit, just slightly. Mm-hmm. Um, I prefer I prefer having a a story that I can get my teeth into, and you can sit and watch two or three episodes and really get deep into something. And I think Discovery did it quite well. It makes me wonder a little bit how much of it is to do with ratings. Keep people interested, keep watching, rather than if it's just a, a monster of the week, 
you can throw an episode away, not you can miss it, and not worry about it. Whereas if you've got the storyline, you have to watch it to keep up with it. I think there is also a degree of like social media being an, an aspect of it because it's like we always use like social media. Oh, pejorative! So, social media, what an awful thing! And it's like it is, but guess what? We are all here on a social media platform, and we're talking about series long arcs, and it's really mm. really fun to just check mm. in every week and go, "What do you think of today's episode?" You do the whole water cooler moment, and you can't. You can kind of do that with episodic. You know, it's the case of what do you think of the episode? Oh, I thought, like, you know, um, you know, the, the you know, in the light. Oh, what a great episode! But then it's like, if you have an episode like the one where freaking it's all about Alexander and saving the little twigs and the soliton wave generator, it's like I ain't got a fucking thing to say about that. Um, I fucking don't remember what that episode was called. Um, but it's like you want to get people engaged. You want to start a conversation. Um, and I'm, I'm going to keep on using Doctor Who, and I'm going to keep on using stuff like um, like Fallout or The Mandalorian. There are genuine conversations that happen, if you, especially if you go for the every week drop mm -hmm. an episode. And you get to sustain that momentum. You get to build up your Twitter hashtags. You get to build up massive conversations. Like Interview with a Vampire on AMC right now has got like a massive fan going, and people are just you know, the, the gagging for the next episode. And that keeps the fandom going for a lot longer, mm -hmm it gets the fandom culture going and that builds a fan base over a much longer period of time. Granted, you can still do that with an episodic format, especially if you're syn uh, syndicated, because you, you can just like, you watch it as much as you want instead of having to worry about like you know, paywalling and, oh, I've got to remember to cancel my Paramount Plus because I've already watched the season or whatever. But I think, especially nowadays, like, serialization is important if you want people on social media to give a toss about your show. People want to see Star Trek Discovery trending. They want to see Fallout trending and then go... This thing's got ridiculously amazing reviews. That clip looks really cool. Like the amount of times I've sold someone on watching something by just showing them like a two or three minute clip of a show or just an episode of something. And it's like, that's a way easier sell through social media than it ever is through like, no, bro, it, it, it gets good after like 10, season, 10 episodes. Don't worry. Don't, trust me, bro. <laughs> trust me. Yeah. Like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it gets real good, I promise. That's the uh, anime promise. I'm going to disagree with that because I, I think the key ingredient is good writing. And it doesn't matter if it's serialized or episodic. What what brings people in is the good writing. And you you say, if you can sell someone on a two or three minute clip, then serialization has nothing to do with it. You know, it's it's the, the action of the scene, the way it's directed. Um, but I've heard so many people say, yeah, I wanted to get into it, but it's just too far along now. I, I don't understand the story. It would I'd have to watch all this stuff to get into it. And so I feel like serialization is actually a barrier to entry for a lot of people. So um, to bring things back around on the topic, I, you know, I could go either way. I've enjoyed serialized. I've enjoyed episodic. What actually bummed me out when I first heard it was, oh, we're going to do 15, 13 episode seasons. We've had this conversation before, so I won't go too long, but... In terms of runtime, total hours produced, all of New Trek is about the same as one of the Berman era Treks. So if you're asking me, you know, which would you prefer? Well, <laughs> all things being equal, I would take, you know, 200 plus episodes of, um, you know, 20, 24 episodes a season. And, you know, everything isn't equal. But so, so that did bum me out. And uh, in terms of Discovery specifically, did it help or hurt? I guess for me, it kind of hurt because if I felt like if I couldn't get into the stream early on that I felt like maybe it wasn't watching later on where if it's episodic I can someone say no episode 8 is great oh well, I can jump in and watch that and not need any foreknowledge so mm. um, I think there's pluses and minuses but yeah. did anyone else have any serialized thoughts before I, we I move think, on I think um, you know and I forgot my point already fuck I literally just had it on my top of my tongue no <laughs> It was it was poignant. Your it was thoughts amazing. are it would have wired you all and turned the argument against it's you. Okay. Like, I forgot. Your, it's okay. Thoughts are too I got one yeah. more thing. Well, you know, so so binge watching also the fact that that you know if you come in a little bit later you can get caught up real quickly, real easily, uh, and yeah, the episodes are kind of long. You know, they are some of them are full hours. Sometimes I think even just a few minutes over too. So it's yeah. a little bit of a slog mm -hmm. when you're used to watching forty two minutes. You know, made for ads TV. Um, but but yeah, the the binge watching aspect, uh, you know, it really helps to to keep you on track with the serialized content, with the evolution of the characters, because these characters aren't made from briefs, like you know, uh, Bones and and, uh, and and Scotty. You know, the, these characters were meant to evolve over time and have things really impact them. So um, so it's much easier to track when, when you have you know that ability. 
Did they give you enough time to think about what you were going to say? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the modern era of streaming television is very new, very untested, and we're starting to see the fallout of it all, really, aren't we? With a lot of things being cancelled, a lot of services struggling, like Paramount mm. Plus and all the troubles it's having. And that kind of is affecting Star Trek. And it's affecting a few other, it's affecting the Star Wars world and Marvel as well. You know, not, not just sort of like, you know, uh, our own sort of little universe. And people, like, you know, the, the fact is they'll, they'll make five ser- series of a show because they think, well, people won't subscribe to us service and this affects things and it's it is a detriment to it and i kind of agree with auto that yeah i would love a 30 you know 20 to 30 season series where we can really see some evolution of these characters or really get into them if they are going to do it serialized but unfortunately the the money and the 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 networking enthusiasm isn't there for it which is a shame which is genuinely a shame so i don't i don't think you can complain about lack of content and then also having too much content to catch up on at the same time like those are Mm. (laughs) <laughs> those those two complaints can directly cancel each other out. Like, are you complaining that you have to watch more Star Trek to catch up with the Star Trek, and then simultaneously complaining that there's not enough Star Trek for you to watch? <laughs> well, uh, all right, this is not whatever. I'm gonna go for it. What if to get up to get caught up with a story, you had to watch Threshold before you watch the next episode? Would that make you like serialization more? Like, there's gonna be stinkers along the way. Mm. The one of the pluses of episodic is you can just skip kind of the trash that everyone knows is bad and and go to the next one. Like when you're rewatching and you get to Shades of Grey, you're like, well, I might miss some important Riker developments, so I better watch this one. And you're like, no, I'll just skip. But it's 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 well, a, wait, say all that. the Riker developments in Shade of Shades of Grey. What do you mean? That's a, that's a summary of Riker. So, Riker. so you think it's a seminal episode for Star Trek? Yeah, yeah in, in, in that it's the worst episode of Star Trek <laughs> okay. ever. Yeah, but you know that's the nature of serialized television. Part of the advantage is now because TV uh, audiences have uh, grown and evolved, they're more familiar with the the genres and with the formulas of Star Trek. So you don't have to watch every single episode to to catch up to episodes of Star Trek. I, I've had people. I've had people watch Discovery with me who were not familiar with earlier seasons and been able to follow along in the the episodes because the archetypes are all there they they they, they understand how story te- television storytelling works hmm. now so i think there's a degree of truth to that and if you want to jump into say like season three especially like season three is a great jumping on point because you know it's a space a soft reboot of the show but having just finished season four like literally about two hours ago if i jumped into like episode 11 of season four i would not have a fucking clue what the hell was going on um and like what it says that is a legitimate problem like if i wanted to watch um like the only time i could think of that being an issue is if oh i really want to watch family um well i gotta watch best of both worlds. what an imposition but like you know there's an expectation but even then i could still just watch family because i still get just enough context within the episode but like it's the, it's still a self-contained story in its own right. It, it's part of a trilogy, but it, it works on its own. Whereas episode eleven of Discovery, it's it's basically hour eleven of a thirteen episode of a thirteen-hour well, yeah, episode. You, really, you'd have to start mm. at the beginning of a season, but you don't yeah, need to watch yeah. all three seasons. The only Trek show you yeah. really need to watch for any of these episodes is the show previously on Star Trek, right? Like that's <laughs> that's the best Star Trek show on television previously. All right, go, go ahead and put down your markers. We'll pick this up when we get to talking about season five again, because I think they do depart a little bit in terms of dropping in episodic stuff. So we'll get back to that. Um, Overtired in chat says, I'm halfway through season three and discovery is exhausting. It's always action. The stakes are high. There's little chance to breathe. I like it, but it's exhausting. So I guess that is another... <laughs> serialization versus episodic you do get a soft reset at the end of every week uh for episodic go ahead Sean. sounds like sex <laughs> <laughs> i like it it's exhausting but it's i, I, like it, but it's exhausting. I thought i thought you meant marathoning 12 hours in a row i you know yes that too here. yes okay i i think there are definite like peaks and valleys in terms of like a series like um in terms of the structure, like if you think of like the episodes of like you know, like, into like freneticness and and pace, like let's take season three for example. Season three, like you know, the first three or four episodes are pretty. Oh, we've got to get out of the ice. We've got to worry about like the whole courier bullshit. We got and there's so much to kind of go on. And then it's like then we get to Krill and things calm down a little bit. And then da 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 da. And then like especially like, the last three episodes, like you kind of had to watch them 
almost as a mini movie. Oh, we're trying to lose momentum. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm glad you're paying so much attention to my point. Um, but yeah, no, I think it is a point that, like, it especially with Discovery and the way it's paced. Like, I don't feel like it's that much of a problem with with Picard or even with Prodigy, where it's a case of there's a feeling of the episodes come in blocks of high energy, and then there's like one or two that slow things down, and a little bit less of a hard spike and more of a you know an oscillation would be might maybe nice is kind of what I, I think overtired is driving at there they probably said it better than i did i'm like operating on very little sleep right now all right i'm gonna go ahead and move us on to the sticky wicket in the room uh, and i gave you guys a heads up on this one <clears throat> i don't think it's anyone's favorite topic to talk about but I think it's it's also integral to discovery at this point. I think it's kind of part of the show, as much as I hate to say it. So let's talk about fan response, the division of the fan base, the pushback, and um, you know, I because <laughs> so we started this idea what three weeks ago. We're like, all right, season's coming up. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about this. Here's some of the topics. And since then, I've I've come across some interesting parallels. You have Star Wars: The Acolyte. <laughs> which has been review bombed. Uh, you're going to hear the phrase culture war a lot. And, you know, there are legitimate criticisms that get buried under avalanches of, well, this fucking sucks because I'm a bigot. And then the other side pushes back. And, you know, trying to read social media on that has, has been a trip. Also, uh, women's basketball. I've been getting into that recently. There is a uh, an athlete, a white, straight, female basketball player who... Uh, has just entered the league. She was all-time leading scorer in college, so there's a big following behind her, bringing a lot of eyes to the product. Their their views and their um, attendance has doubled or tripled overnight. Very popular player. Now, a lot of the existing players are, um, the majority are black, and there's a, a large number of gay players, you know, compared to the uh, the rest of the population. So they have sort of their, their niche audience that feels, you know, uh, maybe safe, to go there and not be harassed by people who don't, who have issues with them. I'm, I'm trying to tiptoe around what I'm saying here, but, um, and so I, you know, I've been following the, the league. I've been watching the games. I'm like, you know, this is quality sports entertainment. I'm like, I'm, I'm enjoying the games. Actually, I enjoy it better than the NBA, the guys basketball. And then I go online to Reddit or, or Twitter or wherever you want to go. And if you want to talk about the game, good fucking luck because you have, it's it's become you know totally politicized you have bigots on one side you have bigots on the other side you have legitimate fans on both sides and you can't say anything about the game without this player's name coming up and well everyone who likes her is a bigot well and everyone who you know opposes is bigot. and it's so exhausting so when i come back to discovery and think about it you know i'm kind of the guy that just wants to watch the game you know i just want to watch discovery and give my feedback and there's been a pushback. I mean, uh, when I first started, what, six years ago, I started giving my feedback, and most of it was not very flattering because I didn't love the series off the bat. And one of my good friends said, oh, you, you're just making things up. You know, you, this is, you know you're, you're, you're a bad actor. You're just making things up because you, you don't like this or that. <laughs> and another person in our circle uh, intimate that I'm a bigot because I had, you know, criticism of Michael Burnham. And I'm like, hold on. Why is it that this show in particular is such a lightning rod? You know, we've had black captains, we've had female captains, we've had black female captains in other series, but this one in particular has kind of been a lightning rod. So I'm going to break this into two parts. First, let's talk about the bigotry. They're going to get their three minutes of fame here. I'm sure everyone has a little bit of opinion on that. And then let's move on to maybe the more legitimate criticisms and why there's been pushback on either side. So there are two bigots. In, in this in this arena because this isn't this is a long long conversation that we probably won't do too much on it but there are two kinds of bigots they're the ones that are actually the bigots and people who basically will object to any person race or creed being different from themselves and um objecting and then there are the bigots that aren't really bigots but will cash in that youtube ad money because they know that clicks will sell and they are invariably a little bit worse because they're encouraging and uh and i'm not going to name names but there is a certain subset of youtube channels out there that specialize in that and they are awful and have spread uh, you know it, it, needless propaganda yeah you can like like auto says and we, we me stars auto we've had frank conversations about discovery and like open to interpretation and open to everyone's arguments whether you liked it or not it's fine disliking something 
but disliking because somebody's black because somebody's a woman is an, just an awful excuse and yeah Sorry, I want to come back and just say, and if you guys have an idea, and this may die down now that the series is over, but if you guys have ideas on how to combat that, how to fix it, when you interact with other people, by all means, voice that as well. Because I think is, okay. we're all kind of looking for a lifeline as to how we can there is a jump very into famous, this, no strings attached. Very famous Mark Twain quote, which I quote all the time. I use it as my my tent pole in life. I use this all the time. It's never argue with an idiot because they'll bring you down to their level and beat you with experience. Just don't engage with them just walk away you know i've stopped going to discussion threads where i know it's going to be terrible like you know watch my, my typical thing used to be watch a show and i go oh, i'll go on a reddit look at the discussion thread see what everyone else they'll be like, oh they hated it i really enjoyed that you know and it's kind of i have stopped myself doing that because it ends up just kind of like warping my own opinion because i care what other people feel like and it's it's it, discovery definitely has that effect of like you can watch it but you will still have the stigma of oh wow there was all this controversy of it over it and that's it it, it hurts the yeah I, I let I left. I left numerous Discovery fan groups simply because I just didn't want to get involved. You'd go on to talk about the episode, just chat about it, and you just it's, you just get so much hate from both sides. Mm. One person will say, "But it's, it seems to be the way things are these days, especially in the the, the critical world of yeah. criticizing it. Mm. If you don't like something, it's it's the worst thing you've ever seen, and it's because of this and this and this and this. It's not just oh yeah, I didn't like it too much, but." And it's a broad oh, cultural whatever. thing, and it's a very poignant cultural thing at the moment. There's a guy in my office that's, that complains when people put pronouns on emails. I'm like, it doesn't fucking hurt you, dude. Like, what's mm. more serious you? But, yeah, sorry. I get very angry. Yeah, so... <laughs> so, I, I want to talk on this, because um, I think it's important to have some historical context in that... So, as I mentioned, we have had black captains, we've had black female captains before... And people were just as racist to Avery Brooks as they were to Sneeple Martin Green. Mm. Obviously, they weren't as a sexist. Um, yes, we have had black female captains before with, um, you know, George's mother with Silver LaForge and with um, Madge Sinclair, I believe, in Voyage Home. So there is historical precedent for these characters, Lower but Dex. they were not the main character. Yeah, well, Blessing Lower Decks came after, so I'm kind of putting it into historical perspective. Um, I'll send hate mail to a cartoon. And. Uh, uh, hmm. <laughs> you kind of can. Um, now with that Scott attitude, Idol. <laughs> You're not trying um, hard enough. <laughs> but here's the thing. So, like, Avery Brooks got a ton of racist abuse, and you can go back and you can read those Star Trek magazine views, and it's like, people don't like to talk about it because DS9 is now a critical darling, but there was a heavy racist um, response to that. Um, and it's not a part of the fandom that we like to talk about, because I think that Star Trek fans, and I also have experience from another fandom I'm big in with X-Men fans, it's a fandom that's all about inclusivity and tolerance and diversity and infinite diversity and different combinations, right? Um, and then you look around and then you go, why the fuck are you here? You're a bigot. And the, guess what? That kind of person I have no time for, I have no tolerance for, you just block me and move on. That's how I, I kind of like go with it. Um, and then it, it, it did kind of... Here's the thing, I love Strange New Worlds to bits, right? But I did think it was a little bit suspect that Discovery was catching an awful lot of flack with a black female character, main character, and then Strange New Worlds has a straight mate, uh, male white white character as the captain, and suddenly it's the Good Good Darling. Mm. And now I know that's completely unfair because mm. Picard got its, uh, its fair share of drubbing, um, and Lower Decks has been pretty much universally praised with like Beckett as being essentially the main character mm -hmm. um, but it's stuck in my craw a little bit yeah, because it felt a little bit like these two are very similar projects in fact Stranger Worlds would not exist without Discovery but it felt a little bit like this is the acceptable side of diversity I can accept this because it's not what it's not in my face, which is always the thing I, I hate mm. about. Like I, 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 I can yeah, accept them being here. You're, you're right yeah. for a, a different reason than I think what you're trying to put out. I think you're right because um, you know the people that would watch wouldn't watch Discovery would watch this pushed up there a little bit. But also, um, you know, Strange Worlds is written excellently well. This wouldn't have it wouldn't no, have it got is. into it, it if Anson Mount hadn't been utterly amazing in Discovery season two. Like that was definitely pushed on him. Absolutely, and I think it, it, that discussion mm. kind of doesn't exist in that space because 
it's it's mm. it's it got a series through other merits, and I think it, it couldn't really suddenly. Well, it's just one of those things. But you of do like, have you do have that discussion saw- in Strangely Wells yeah. because you have the Admiral Robert April situation where they recast him as a mm. black man. You know, even though he wasn't canonically yeah. anything other than a cartoon. But yeah, I digress. Yeah. It's just one of those things of like it, I, I've never really brought it up because I feel like it is a false equivalence. I feel like Strange New Worlds absolutely stands on its own merits, and it's like I, it would be it's a disservice to both series to say, "Well, you like one because one's got a, a male white straight character and one doesn't." It's like, and I don't. That's why I never bring it up because I feel like it's a false equivalence. Say, but it does make me wonder if Michael Burnham were a straight white male character, would the response to their character be as strident? Of course not. I no. wonder no. that. No. And that's and it's like you know it's like it, I feel like that's part of the conversation. I think um, if she took her shirt off in season one, like Anson Mount did, maybe she would get <laughs> more praise. But that, that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, I think there is this case of like in the Star Trek fandom, you like to imagine that everyone is like you. Everyone is a like open-minded, you know, like you know, left-wing leaning or just like, they're at least accepting tolerant individual. But yeah, uh, like you, idol, you. Um, and angry. then you look around and people aren't. Pe- there are there are people who are like, I'm only here for the space battles. I'm only here because I like that character. I like this, but only this far. Um, no farther. Now that being <laughs> no further. Um, and I feel like it's a problem. I mean, it's a case of like, I don't quite know how to tackle that because you can't just evict people from the fandom space. Like the what the best you can do is to say, I'm not going to engage with that Reddit discussion thread. I'm going to block that person on Twitter or Tumblr. I'm going to just not engage with that. Because I can count on them on like you know, maybe you know, both my hands the number of times I've reached out to someone who has legitimately had a different point of view, and this isn't even like a racist thing, just like in terms of how they view media, and they'll actually listen to my point of view and change how they see something because of something I said. Like I can, and most of the time it's one of you guys um, because we're friends. And it's like especially like a random stranger on Reddit or whatever. It's like they're never gonna fucking listen to me. Um, but yeah, no, it's 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 a conversation. I rambled. I apologize. Dan, shy. <laughs> Thoughts? Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I really like the point you had, Stars, about um, you don't want to evict anybody from the fan space. And, and the real reason why is because eventually, given time, if somebody has just a hint of tolerance in them, then I think Star Trek will win them over. And so, I mean, initially, so you may not be able to connect with Michael Burnham. Um, it's not Burnham's fault. That you can't connect with her. It's not Sonequa Martin, Martin Green or the, the showrunner's fault. It's a choice they made, and it's a choice for inclusivity and to give a different face to the show um, so that eventually people may see that here is not a black woman. Here is a leader. Here is a flawed character that has made mistakes and will make mistakes. Uh, here's a character who is a friend. And those those facets, I think, are points of connection for some people. It certainly is for me. Um, there, there's there's something about Burnham's character that that I really eventually connected with that off put me initially. She is momentarily casual. She will, in in he, the heat of the moment, right before she's about to commit something, um, she will just have a little quip like, "Let's fly" or "Let's let's do it." You know, just you know, she just where you know she's gone over the edge and, and now she's ready and. And I thought initially, man, that's just a little bit trite, but no, it, it grew on me. It's just, it's it's something that I, you know, I didn't think I would connect with initially. And now I, I just, I understand. And, you know, she thinks out loud. She speaks out loud. She, she's comfortable enough with herself to let people see that part of her in the moment. And, you know, it's, it's something I didn't expect going into it. And I'll also point out too that um, in the beginning, in season one, Captain Lorca was our captain. Uh, you know, he was a, a presumably straight, certainly a white man. And got, I think in early episodes, not as much screen time as Michael Burnham did, but certainly was the focal point of the bridge. So to say that there was not something for the establishment viewer to really latch on to may not be exactly true because uh, he, he was certainly there and, and didn't show his true stripes until episodes in. So I don't know. Those are just my random thoughts. I don't have a whole lot to speak from 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 my position in terms of inclusivity and tolerance. But it, there was something that grew on me, and specifically about Sonequa Martin Green's performance as the show went on that that really drew me into her character. And it was just it was it was fresh and unexpected. So that's why I appreciated it. Cake is eternal. <laughs> Cake is mm-hmm. eternal. Um. Yeah, look, when we're when we're in a society that has such institutional racism, misogyny, homophobia, uh, 
it's going to be impossible for anyone, you know, whether you're regressive, progressive, whatever, to not feel those effects. Um, so when you encounter something new, like a protagonist that is black and female, like Sinequa Martin Green, Michael Burnham, it, it's it's going to catch some people's ears wrong. It, they're, it's going to catch their eyes wrong. It's going to rub them the wrong way. And they may not realize that it's that institutionalized racism and misogyny. They might just default to being like, oh, well, it must be the writing. It must be uh, the, the overblown shaky cam, which doesn't actually exist as much in the series as people claim it does. Um, it's, it's the way the Klingons talk. They're, you're going to blame it on anything else other than the fact that you grew up in this world that has this deep-seated racism and misogyny and bigotry in it. Um, I remember in the first season, so many people were complaining about Michelle Yeoh's accent, you know, and she purposely leaned into her Malaysian accent to force the viewer's ear to hear a different way of speaking English, right? People don't complain when there's like a heavy Irish accent or a French accent or a Southern accent or a Boston accent in television. Those are just, they're just different accents that are brought to the English language, you know? And it just might take your ear a second to, to hear it, but that's it. Um, and now no one complains about Michelle Yeoh's accent because she's awesome and everyone's finally realized that she's awesome and uh, you can jump a motorcycle onto a train you can't so um yeah i mean i just today you know i i have not left those star trek groups online i i i keep with them because i i refuse to cede my fandom to uh to bots and uh and racist people and someone wrote when diversity is done right it's not noticeable and all I wrote back to them was, so diversity is only done right if it's not noticeable to you. And it's like, you know, diversity is not special effects. It's not sound design. It, it, it's, it's people. There are people that exist. Um, and so you, know, you may have grown up in your 50 plus years seeing like two dimensional shadows on the wall of the cave, like in Plato's analogy of the cave. And now you're in the sunlight and you're seeing three-dimensional figures. Um, and so they're going to seem strange and weird to you, but they are uh, as legitimate as the shadows on the wall of that cave. So it's just, it's just a, a new world. and You just have to kind of learn to appreciate it. The thing I've always loved about the actors in Discovery, because they've encountered so much hate, Wilson Cruz and Sonequa martin Green, they respond with nothing but love. Nothing but love for the fandoms. Even the fans that... that express nothing but contempt for them so kudos to them for, for those responses I, I i know you know not everyone agrees with these that is the pitfall of always being right uh cranky go on. <laughs> <laughs> oh i think did i go i think i already went on this the stars one. i see your mouth Why, did you already did, did you have something to say before i move some no no I, I think i pretty eloquently summed up yeah I want to throw my point of view here a little bit because when I asked you guys what you remember, your first impressions, I neglected to give mine. So I'm going to drop it in here. This was uh, 2016. It was like our, our first look at stuff. And so when I thought, you know, what, what do I remember my first thought being? My first thought was, oh, they're going to have gay people in there. And I didn't like that. I was raised um, as hardcore Christian right-wing fundamentalist. And eight years ago, I thought, oh, I don't want to have that gay shit shoved in my face. Auto fails the get emotional challenge every time on the stream. My apologies. <clears throat> and so, you know, I was not, I was not racist, but I was homophobic and transphobic. And it's like, you know, I tried to do my best of enjoy Enjoy the show. You know, if you're going to critique it, critique it for the right reasons. And I will say, I don't think that really turned me off to characters. Because we're here in season five, and I'm like hungry for more Wilson Cruz. I think I told Stars the other day, like, I think um, Stamets is probably the most underwritten character. Like, who I want to see the most from. I feel like he has more range than he was ever given. 
But you know, when I watch an episode with my old man, that what he always pulls away is, oh, there were two guys kissing and, and, I, and that really bothers me. And it's like, well, you know, I don't think I can reach him at this point, but maybe I can reach the next person uh, that I talk to who's been in a similar spot. Because, you know, it's okay to change your views over time. That doesn't make you like a bad person or a flip-flopper. But, um, yeah, I mean, I had issues with it. And I didn't go around blasting like, I don't, I want to see less of this character or something. But, yeah, man, it, it affected me. And I, I'm glad to say that I was wrong big time and that I learned from that. But, uh, yeah. I mean, whatever. They've gotten their five minutes of fame. Let's move on to the, the more legitimate criticism. So, I, you know, if we go around again, there's been a lot of criticisms from the over-emotionality to, you know, anything. Serialization, why is Burnham getting 80% of the screen time? So you tell me, like, have there been legitimate issues that you've had where it's been mistaken for, oh, you're arguing in bad faith? Or are there arguments that you see that are like, uh, I don't understand how they could take issue with that, but but things that that are legitimate, having you know, mm. that that we think is not bigotry stuff. I think I think the writing has been up and down. Um, doesn't help that the showrunner left halfway through the first half of the first season. Doesn't help that they've had several different showrunners that have quit and various different writing teams. And you know, as much as we praise Kurtzman for being excellent for the series overall, for being a great. Um, Star Trek leader, he is not the best writer um, in various situations you know, I, I feel like some of the writing has, you know, there are, like you say we need more stammers, we, know, we need more of these characters, there's definitely been the oft criticism that we need to know more about these bridge crew definitely something I was interested mm -hmm. in learning about Detmer and Awoshikun but um, right from the standoff, and there's something they should have blasted out more every, you know, should have promoted more and they say that, you know, it was said early on before season one you know, we're going to do something different we're going to do something not like other Star Trek, and Michael Burnham is the main character. We're going to focus on one person. That was then written the direction. That's been a big criticism all the way through, and I think it's it's been an interesting direction to take. I don't know if I necessarily agree with having one person as the focus. It has been good. I do enjoy Michael Burnham as a character, um, but I definitely think the people around her should have been more integrated into uh, who they are as opposed to sort of who she is as well but that again and that is another cost of what we talk about the serialization and the you know the 13 episode 10 to 13 episode sort of like structures you don't have time for those characters unfortunately in that situation that's kind of my my one big sort of like overall criticism of things yeah I, i'll jump in here and for me it is it is that it's the star trek burnham and if you don't like the character you won't like the show. And I think a lot of my dislike for her ended up being, well, I want to see more of this character and this character and this character. And the reason it doesn't happen is because Burnham is the main character. So I think eventually people just transfer those those feelings to her, earned or otherwise. It's like, well, why can't we have more on this character I like? Well, it's because of Burnham. And then they start to dislike Burnham mm -hmm. when it's, you know, it's not the actress's fault. It's not the character, you know, it can't really be the character's fault. But So you can get mad at, at the writers or the showrunners for, for wanting to focus on that. And then it ends up coming across as either bigoted or, you know, people say, well, we, what's wrong with the character? It's, well, because the other characters need time. And so that was I think, yeah, that's been... Yeah. Sorry. That was, that was my big complaint with, like, the finale of season five is we just didn't get enough of everyone else. Like, Stamets had, like, one complaint note and then disappeared until a hug at the end. And I was just like, well, hang on, he's kind of, like, one of the most important characters in Discovery. Him and Saru are kind of the linchpins of, like, you know, the whole sort of gimmick with Discovery being part of the Mycelia Network. And we just kind of get him to kind of go, like, oh, it's a shame, and then disappeared. So that's, you know, the, the, these characters should have lived and breathed this, this series a little more than... Um, they did, which was a bit of a shame. Well, that's a Paramount executive's fault. That's season five. Uh, yeah. Finale. That, yeah. That's I... not the fault of the show or the writers or the show writers. That's... Um, I, I love Michael Burnham from the first episode when she argued with the computer to let her out of a jail cell. Like, <laughs> that was peak Star Trek, peak Vulcan mm. right there. I, I, I wish there had been more of that, actually, of her just mm. logicking her way out of problems um 
Yeah, I don't even. What was the question originally? <laughs> <laughs> All your complaints. I, issues that you think, uh, if you either oh. have issues that you think people claim aren't legitimate, or if you've come across ones that you just don't get because you think they might be acting in bad faith. I mean, faith, I think either Stars or our friend Nifty, friend of the pod Nifty, might have mentioned that. In this season five, like all the I, I had not found this to be legitimate in the four previous seasons, but the complaints about uh, the overemphasis on sort of emotion and uh, quiet acting scenes in season five hit me more than they had in any. Mm -hmm. I never had any problem with it. I love mm -hmm. up until season five, Star Trek Discovery was my second favorite. Star Trek show tied with TOS. Like TNG and then TOS and Discovery were tied. I have rewatched the first two seasons of Discovery like a dozen times. I really enjoy the show. And then season five just came along and uh, it kind of screeched to a halt. Like, and in that, those finales, the finale, they like put Michael Burnham up against an actor playing a progenitor who acted exactly the same way as her so it was sort of it was sort of like too much of of the same it, it wasn't it was, it was like she was acting with a mirror so it, it was yeah i think there are legitimate uh con complaints but i think the the vast majority of them harken back to what i was saying in the previous segment but uh mm. that's just me I, I, I like discovery i think i think the worst complaint that people have for me that sort of bugs me is the whole Klingon thing they're not my Klingons, they don't look like Klingons, what does a Klingon look like? It's an alien race, how can you, how can you say that? I mean even they, we didn't, we don't see Klingons from season 3 onwards and yet people still mm. to, to, in season 5 are saying oh it's not, Discovery is not Star Trek because of the Klingons I mean, look, that's just ha look at humans. Look at—I mean, don't look at us. We're all, ma yeah. we're all marginally the same. But uh, look at the majority. No, but even, of the human even you five white guys, even you five <laughs> white guys, look vastly different from each other. Yeah. You know, no, there's more homogeneity, no. <laughs> homogeneity be between yeah. amongst the Klingons on Star Trek exactly. than there is in in this screen. I mean, I did. Well, I felt, one I look at Cranky's giant, Cranky's giant studs. It's like no, no human would ever wear those, right? They all have <laughs> those are his war studs. Yeah, yeah. He only yeah. puts those studs in when he's going to war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my battle, my battle hoops. But yeah, like I don't know how much of it, how much of this is true. But in, it just feels to me like the writers or the producers kind of gave in I kind of a think little they bit. Did, yeah. Season two, they, they gave them hair. They gave them a bit more traditional Klingon style armor, and it felt like they just kind of caved in a little bit to the screaming fans. That's, that's my biggest disappointment with like. season three onwards. Is like, where are we? You're in a whole new century, right? What's happened to all these existing people? Okay, the Vulcans yeah, are reunited. Are where are the Klingons? They're like a huge thing of Star Trek. Yeah. You could just say like, oh, they're doing their thing, like you know, but no mention whatsoever. And that did feel like a bit of a cop out. Like it's like, oh, we shouldn't talk about the. <laughs> Don't mention the Klingons, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know what's funny? Because they go out of their way to to fix the uh, short tricks. Oh, hanging, yeah. hanging, uh, yeah. Chad. Yeah. But they won't just give us a scene with, like, all three types of Klingons in it, like a, yeah. like an augment Klingon, a, yeah. a TOS yeah. movie Klingon, and a Discovery Klingon. They just walk in into a, a room, bar. just hanging out. <laughs> yeah. Or and right, and just be like, oh, look, maybe the race that is obsessed with genetic manipulation of itself has a lot of species diversity within it. Mm. Yeah. I think one of my sort of like criticisms that I've gone back and forth with, I have a sort of complicated relationship with, is the Michael Burnham is the most important mm. character in the entire universe. Because mm. there are times when that is absolutely not true. And then there are times where it's true. Um, and it's like, guess what? I love season two of Discovery. The incredibly contrived coincidence of like Gabrielle Burnham being the Red Angel and all that. It's just like, hmm. And a lot of the time, the whole like, the, the relationship with Spock and Sarek, and the thing is, I love all the development with Spock and Sarek. Like, without that, you wouldn't have like um, Ethan Peck as Spock. You wouldn't have Stranger Worlds. Like, they wouldn't exist without all that. And yet, at the same time, it did feel a little bit like you know, like I've done, I've read and written my own share of fan fiction, and that's the one thing you don't do. You don't make them the long lost brother of X Y Z important canon character. Mm -hmm. 
because it screams of desperation and it screams of I need to borrow legitimacy and I don't know whether or not that was what they were doing or if they just legitimately were like no we have a really strong idea of where to take this character and it's like it, it really does come and go how relevant that entire backstory is to her like in one episode it'll be like the linchpin the reason why everything succeeds and other times it'll just completely succeed it's like well now she's just you know someone else can play it entirely and it doesn't really factor into her um I think it's it's I, and I, 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 and, I, sorry go I just want to interject very quickly I think like the Burnham and Spock stuff like yeah it was a little bit contrived at first you're a bit like you know it just reminds me of the meme of that guy slap at the car you know and it hits it's Spock it's like <laughs> wow this baby can hold so many uh, unknown siblings on it you know Cheaper um, siblings, yeah. yeah exactly and it, you know it, it yeah it is true a bit contrived but I kind of feel like with season two they earned it with the interaction specifically yeah. with Burnham and Spock and their arguments and the sort of the backstory mm. they established yeah they rewrote canon but it, I kind of feel like they rewrote it for the better and added a little bit more of a dynamic in there. And, you know, her being the reason he encouraged to, like, look out for people that aren't like him, um, you know, very specifically like that. And I feel like, like yourself, I do also feel like, yeah, Burnham did become a little bit the centre of the universe, and especially it hit me in season three when it turns right, you know, all oh, the negotiation between the Navarre and the Federation suddenly, oh, wait, yeah, because Burnham's the, the the sister of Spock, so she's now the important linchpin of this, a bit like, oh, yeah, come on, can we just, you know, get to the good stuff now, please? <laughs> Yeah, but meanwhile, Pike travels back in time to make sure they save Spock because Spock is the most important person in the 23rd century. <laughs> and no one took any any umbrage yeah, with that. He is. That's the difference. <laughs> he kind of is. Ah, see? Yeah, but it's, but then he, it, well, so it's the house of Sarek that is the most important house well, yeah. one thing in the I've history heard of Star Trek. I've, I've heard is the argument is, well, is it earned or unearned? <clears throat> you know, if you're doing something season one of a new show with a new character maybe you can say it's unearned spock has been in the public consciousness for what 60 50 years at that point so if you want to give him more credence more gravitas i think that's the argument that most people make into why one works and and the other doesn't work uh, dan did you have any thoughts on this before we move to the season breakdowns why well, i did and you're not gonna like it because i <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. First, thanks, so first, I mean... you talk about maybe Spock's gravitas being earned, but it, I, I argue it was stolen. Um, I, I've seen, I've seen, and also kind of also feel the criticism that the show jumped the Spock in season two. You know, we <laughs> we need uh, we 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 needed uh, something to draw in more fans, maybe more traditional fans that have been hating on the show. So why not bring back the most beloved character of all time? And not only that, but let's let's start cribbing notes off of Star Trek Five and picking picking uh, one of the most contrived plot points from the objectively worst sorry auto movie of the original series <laughs> franchise that's great uh, <laughs> Lawrence Luck so, and Bill's making a comeback <laughs> we'll see Lawrence uh, Luck and Bill <laughs> so so all right uh, getting beyond that my my uh, the, the other thing that wasn't mentioned yet was uh, its prequel status so you know th this kind of got yeah. some eye rolls with Star Wars when they pulled it with the original trilogy and and those those same uh, you know threads were pulled on when when Discovery came out as being a prequel to everything else and so and we already had the the reinvention with Star Trek 2009 and, and you know things were as classic as they could be while still being presented as modern they had to update uh, you know the, the the bridge and the feel and the uniforms so you know but it's still and you Enterprise. Know, yeah, 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 but it still it still pissed off the the purists who said, "Hey, you could you could do it in next generation the relics and completely reproduce the original bridge in every single way." So why wouldn't you? Well, because it sucked, right? I mean, it was Christmas lights on cardboard, and you know you you gotta you gotta make. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm turning off everybody right now. Anyway, <laughs> so these were the criticisms that I observed <laughs> while I was reading about Star Trek and couldn't watch it because it was paywalled. You know so. how we hate bigots, anyway. Dan. Why would you? All right. <laughs> why would you say? Hold something on. so controversial yet so bold <laughs> dad dad hold, hold on hold on dad did okay. you did you write jump the spark did you just, I, I, just actually, I actually just came up with that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hold on Amazing. hold on All right. wait um, this means yeah, burnham's I, the fonz yeah. <laughs> i was thinking that burnham burnham's the one jumping yeah. <laughs> Wow. Look, if it saved the Federation, Michael Burnham would jump as many sharks as she needs to. She, she's on those jet skis. She goes, let's fly, and then takes <laughs> off. <over there>. <laughs> <laughs> Not going to lie, I would watch that. I would enjoy if they did that. 
That needs to be a very, very short trek because, mm. you know, <laughs> oh. surely Happy Days is public domain by now. We can just steal that, right? <laughs> I feel like he falls on the parody. I mean, yeah, they need to make up for that snot episode. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and move on and do season by season. And you can say as much or as little, little or as much until I cut you off as you'd like about each season. So I task stars to give us a, a quick summary of each to kind of refresh memory of what's going on. So stars, hit me with see what happened in season one. The first step forward into new Trek or modern Trek, Discovery Season 1 starts off in 2256 with the opening shots of the Federation Klingon War and the mutiny of up-and-coming uh, First Officer Michael Burnham, which sees her demoted to specialist and put to work assisting the mysterious Captain Gabriel Lorca with his efforts to win the war. Heavily serialized, dark and gritty, this season weaves together narratives about Klingon identity, romance, the mirror universe, and the rise of fascism, and ends with Laurel, newly minted Chancellor of the Klingon Empire, declaring the war to be over as the Discovery crew gives her impressive leverage over the rest of the High Council. Reinstated to First Officer, uh, the season ends with a tantalizing glimpse of the USS Enterprise for Michael Burnham. I like season one a lot. Uh, season one? Yeah, I, li I like it. Awesome. It's, it's, um, it's very different, and it takes point of view from something you haven't seen before, which is from an a Burnham at the time non-Federation or non-Starfleet officer as she is a prisoner a specialist and you see things from being persecuted and being sort of like having to do things the hard way you know having to leverage Stamets to do something having to make friends with an ensign in order to sort of like feel integrated and battling her own Vulcan human heritage at the same time as well but also we see Lorca and Lorca for the first 70% of that series was awesome i loved him as a character mm. i was just like this is a captain that's different he's a wartime captain he's someone that knows how to cut the edge he's a bit gritty and then it was revealed he was from the <laughs> universe and i was just a bit like ah uh, and then he suddenly it wasn't just that but it was suddenly that he suddenly just sort of suddenly went like ah, hi, i'm the evil one now blah 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 and i was a bit like no, okay right now i'm, now I'm not See, i quite i quite liked that twist at first but that was because I was thinking they were going to bring Prime Lorca back, and we'd, yeah. we'd keep Lorca then. We'd have Prime exactly, Lorca. Exactly, yeah. That, if Prime Lorca comes back happens. and is just the same as like season one, early season one Lorca, then I'd be like, yeah, yeah, this is great. I like this character. I like this captain that's ever so slightly not afraid, you know, not afraid to take a, a criminal and put them in a, in a serious position, not afraid to do the, what it needs what needs to be done in order to fund, you know, make this spore drive work and, and win the war. Well, of course, he feels comfortable around prisoners because he's like. Uh, he's a bigger prisoner. Like, if you're evil, he's more evil. Like, you can't one up him, anyways. <laughs> but no, no but the... what you said at first it made me think Lorca is is a jilf. He's a jellico. I'd like to, you know, he's like <laughs> jellico but cooler and handsomer. And yeah. he's, you know, so mm. the um... Jason Isaacs. You can't beat Jason Isaacs. No. The Klingon War stuff yeah. was interesting. I didn't like how they pushed it so close to the Klingon border because we knew there was a Klingon war. Um, we knew it was coming because it was, you know, it was mentioned in TOS that the Federation and the Klingon had been, been a bit of war with each other. Um, but I did like that it ended up resolving with, like, the Ash Tyler dynamic and the Laurel dynamic, which I liked. I wasn't too keen on the whole Torchbearer thing. Um, the Takuvma kind of, uh, you know, race of well, um, fanatics. Remain Klingon. Yeah, remain Klingon. I was fine with that, It was okay, but those... And I am not, you know, I agree. You, you can have different varieties of Klingon, but I'm not a huge fan of those type of Klingons. I felt I found them too uh, prosthetic. -y. Like there was a bit too much going on. Like they they lacked honor in a little way. You know, I didn't feel like you could see Garon in that crowd and like being able to lead them. Um, th that being said, I did end up really liking Laurel and her being the sort of mainstay of that uh, culture throughout season two was 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 quite cool. But for season one. Yeah, I I really liked it. I liked that the that they took a bigger risk in making it darker and making it more desperate, um, because that's where the Federation was. See, like you say, you say you couldn't see Gowron in amongst those Klingons, but this is what 150, well, true, 200 yeah. years before Gowron, so it's like a they've like evolved day, obviously yeah. since then. You're right, then. you're right, yeah. Um, but I, I I must I really liked the Klingons. I thought it was brilliant. The first few episodes, I was absolutely on the edge of my seat, glued to it. Um, the Torchbearer story was a little bit strange, um, with the weird thing in space that sends a signal. Yeah, like the suddenly um, transports across the galaxy. There were a few little sort of leaps yeah, of, uh, you know, to bring poetic together justice the Klingon there, houses. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Well, yeah, uh, you're kind of going to get that with Klingons. Um, 
it, it, with season one, it's, I think that season one overall holds up quite well. Um, and then it stumbles really hard in the final act. And it's like, it's the, it's the thing I always come to first when I remember season one. It's like, man, I really, really enjoy Lorca. I really enjoy Saru's arc. Um, of like, you know, you know, I, um, you know, I failed to protect my cat the last time. I will not make the same mistake. Mm-hmm. Um, I enjoy Stamets' whole thing with the Tardigrade, which is awesome. Um, I enjoy all these little dynamics, and I like, you know, like the shock, like, guess what? The shock of finding out, like, for, for people who aren't paying attention to the behind the scenes stuff, which is Ad Latif and like the whole, you know, Vok, you know, whatever. Um, like, you know, when he suddenly snaps Kolba's neck, you're like, well, what the fuck just happened? Yeah. <laughs> um, like, that just came out of nowhere. But in the end, it all comes down to the Federation clinging on war ends with a load of Feder- uh, Federation officers going, we're not going to do anything shifty. We're not going to blow up this planet. So what we're, instead we're going to do is we're going to give the trigger to the bomb to the Klingon and she'll have to... Oh, wait. Fuck. Shit. Mm. Fuck. Fuck. We kind of flew all of our ideals in a... Damn it. Fuck. It's like, it just kind of bottles it right at the end. Like, it, it mm. can't come up with a compelling reason why the Klingons stop fighting because they put the Federation in such a, a, a in such dire straits. It's like, well, you can't realistically come back from this with just one tactical strike. You just have to basically go, we're going to destroy your entire ancestral home, go away. And they had to go, well, it's fine because the Klingon did it and we gave them the bomb. Klingon did so it. That sucks. Mm. That's a really, it's not a very Star trek solution, even though they make a show of standing up to Cornwall on the bridge and saying this is not a Starfleet thing to do. It's, but it, there's there's a disconnect even like, there, and I, I like the rest of it. There's two layers of disconnect as well, because it, was, it wasn't it was just Starfleet, it was they then passed it on to Giorgio, like the mirror Emperor Giorgio, who's then passed it on to, um, well, I suppose Starfleet then passed it on to uh, Laurel. So it was like a double... It's just a lot of holding over, area. yeah. Well, that's that's another one. I I understand the criticism of like Lork basically turning into a mushlast twirling villain, but it's like especially if you understand season one as being about the rise of fascism with the mirror universe and the rise of nationalism with um, the Klingons. It's like well yeah of course Lorca makes a really really compelling case for himself and comes across as a charismatic leader and then reveals himself to be evil because that's kind of what they do. <laughs> the instant they get power, yes they reveal what they because now they have the power. Um, it's just that most of the time you don't hear about it until 40, 50 years after the fact when you read about, oh, so that's where all those people disappeared. Hmm. You know, just like... Hmm. I, I, I think it does flatten out the character. Um, you know, Jason Isaacs is still giving 110%, of course, but it's like, I understand it as a case of... Well, it was 2017, you know, just like there was a, a lot of political stuff going on at the time that they kind of wanted to comment on. I don't know if it quite came across properly. Um... But I feel like they at least made a stab at it, which I, I, mean, I appreciate them trying, but yeah. Season one's uneven, but I like it a lot. All the performances are, are solid, which really helps. Uh, every every mm. member of, of the team that appears on screen just gives it 100%, which is makes it really easy to follow along. And also the writing is on point too. I think I think Lorca's motivations are clear and he does a, a good job of, of you know, here's the prime universe. It doesn't matter. I'll take whatever I want from him. I'm going to pillage it, you know, and, and you're, you're just in the way. Uh, you know, you're something I can leverage. Uh, it makes perfect sense because that's kind of how we use the mirror universe in, in Deep Space Nine. So, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> there's a few episodes yeah, where we, we blatantly uh, steal. So it was nice to, to see that switch, but I think season one did rely a little bit too much on tropes, you know, killing the captain in the first episode. It, it just, it, that, that kind of removed me a little bit from, from being invested in it. Uh, you know, Michelle Yeoh is, is just fantastic. And one of the reasons why I tuned into the series and okay, she, she, she did. Okay. Of course they're going to bring her back. They'll find some way, but you know, just just what a trope that they couldn't do it. Like you know, you're used to Star Trek characters always being able to find the solution and get there in the end, and then you know Michael Burnham just couldn't do it. You know, the, the team just couldn't do it, and that's that's kind of you know, what am I watching here? Like, why, why can't these people do it? Why can't these people bring it home? Um, and then they do it again later on in the series with with the the, the dramatic and brutal death of of uh, Culber, 
And, um, you know, so, okay, you're going to take two main crew members that, that for, the first is, is forgivable because you wanted to set the tone as a real thing. But now here's a character we spent 10 episodes getting invested in, learning to love and seeing a relationship and just having that yanked away and also then trying to make us empathize with, with the character of Tyler while he's co capable of committing such an atrocity. And it, it, it colored his character all the way. I get, I get ill every time I, I saw the Burnham and Tyler relationship from then on just because of how brutal that one scene was. It, it completely colored the character, regardless of the context they tried to portray it. And so that those barriers made it really difficult for me. And, and I feel like also the mirror universe trope really gets pulled in a little bit too much. It was done okay here, but it, it's just, at this point it was already overused. Like every series had their turn at it. And so, you know, just starting out in the very first season, where do you have to go from there? I think I, the, uh, now, okay. oh, go on, you got I, I was just gonna, I, I loved season one of Discovery. Uh, it was, it, they swang for the fences, and to me, they just knocked it out of the park. It was cinematic uh, from from the set design, the gorgeous costume design of this show, even like the subtlety and intricacy of the sound design hearkening back to the original series. They, they, they really like nailed all the backgrounds and sound. Uh, makeup wise, Saru is instantly an iconic. Mm -hmm. creature design um i understand the overly prostheticized complaints about the klingons it was hard for those actors to fully act through uh, those layers of makeup but saru's makeup is so beautifully made that doug jones was able to uh, i mean emote and act if yeah, you're gonna go get on. someone to act through a lot of prosthetics and do it well doug jones is your guy like <laughs> yeah obviously he, he's he's a master you know shape of water uh silver surfer like pan's labyrinth whatever um, and as you were saying, all, even the ancillary bridge characters are instantly iconic. You remember all of them. Uh, the complaints about wanting to know more about them is because their introduction is so strong. You you instantly want to know about more about Detmer and Owashikun um, and Arium. You know, she she but she gets a one off <laughs> episode <laughs> where we get to know her uh, later because uh, yeah. You know. um, I love the Terran twist halfway through the season. I, I thought it was great. That night I went and made a, a cosplay foam Terran pin like, <laughs> I, and I started making that Terran armor like immediately. I, I, <laughs> I took screenshots and just started uh, mapping those out uh, uh, immediately. They were, they were so great. I, I um, you know, as a, as a as a dirty tree hugging uh, hippie liberal, I, I, I was glad that they threw in like make Terran human again and all these these allusions <laughs> to the the election that had just happened Jesus. Uh, in the states um I mean I had criticisms too like I I also was not crazy about uh Ash Tyler I didn't think his and Sinequa Martin Green's chemistry was great it was okay but it wasn't I wasn't like ooh, what's next for them um like Tilly who is great by the way Tilly is another great intro of a character uh, she almost talked that relationship up enough for me to care about them, but beyond that, I, I didn't wasn't super down with their their chemistry. The fight choreography season one was a little meh, uh, and as stars alluded to, um, and they had this problem for the first three seasons. They they rushed the finale. Like Discovery just kept running out of runway in their first three seasons, and their all three of those first finales are just super rushed. Um, but, and I also was super mad when Michelle Yeoh was killed off in the first episode. I was like, oh no, we're just going to have her for flashback. And then Terran, ha Terran mm. Universe happened. And that was a good reveal. Michelle Yeoh comes back as an even better character <laughs> than she started <laughs> off with. She's just chewing the series so beautifully. And you could tell how much fun she was having. Uh, so good. But, um, yeah, I, 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 that's, I love season one. What did, what did you guys think of it visually? As in, like the uh, the ships, and I thought the ships, especially the Klingon, when they had the first big ship battle with the Klingons, I thought that was wonderful. The cleave yeah. ship, that was a whole new. Oh yeah, that was season thing. two, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh no, no, that was season, season one. You're right. No, yeah, no, that was one. in the, the season, that season one. Yeah, yeah. Reappears. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that, that yeah when it season. cuts through that admiral's admiral's yeah. ship. Was, oh, that was so. so I was, good. Like I said, I was on the edge of my seat. Yeah, the, as as the the noted um, ship design nerd, there were some great federations. I'm not too keen on the Klingon yeah. designs here. I feel like they went a bit too far 
like radicalizing them away from the bird of prey mm-hmm. d7 class that we've seen before but the federation designs were superb i felt like they kept the right ethos with those designs they like the gagarin class and the the shenzhou and things like that the shenzhou is a beautiful ship mm. it's one yeah. of my favorites yeah. with the underslung bridge as well was an un- unusual design yeah, it's mm. such a great idea. Overtired, I love your comment. I prefer my space battle to consist of people shouting numbers on the bridge. <laughs> 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 I, I think that visually, it's like uh, we really do have to talk about the fact that like Discovery is like one of the most gorgeous track shows. Like yeah. in terms of like even like right from the off in 2017, such a marked like jump up in terms of production quality. Mm. Not just in terms of like how gorgeous the Shenzhou and the actual Discovery herself is. Um, certain effect shots like the ISS Charon and stuff like that but just I, I do love the set design like stuff like um, like the Discovery's Bridge remains mostly unchanged for all of its run like it's like it's this big open space and it has just that right blend of modern sensibility while still feeling kind of tos and how stark and like grey and like a little bit it has the right mix of elements to make it feel prequely without feeling outdated um the uniforms were an instant classic like every say. time i got to see them again like such a good blend and like getting to see the in-between steps from well, the like enterprise Enter- jumpsuit i was literally into... just going to mention that yeah. yeah going from like enterprise thought, to this yeah, yeah it was very like the uniforms as well when you first look at them you just kind of you know when you're excited about everything it's a new show and you kind of go oh, it's, a, it's a blue uniform with some gold bits on it great yeah but then you look closely and you realize they've got the different rank stripes and they've got the tiny little, little deltas the the yeah, yeah, it's yeah. really good no they're great uniforms. yeah okay uh yeah. let's move um, on to season two in the interest of time wait did you did you say anything Otto? about your no impression? because in the interest of time we're going to move on so stars <laughs> hit me with the uh with the season two headline here well you know what i'm, I'm before we continue i'm gonna just nominate my, my favorite moments from season one i'm gonna just give me two things the entire um, time loop episode, uh, Magic to Wit, Say This Man Go Mad, that's yeah. my pick of the entire season. And a quote, which is Universal law is for lackeys, context is for kings. Context is for kings. Yeah. Fucking <clears throat> iconic instantly. Sorry, I had to get that out there because yeah. I love those moments so much. Now, on to season two, which is maybe my favorite season. Picking up where season one left off, Captain Pike of the Enterprise joins the Discovery as they search for Spock, again, uh, and the cause of the mysterious <laughs> red bursts have appeared all over the Federation. Interweaving more classic Trek adventures with the heavy serialization of the previous season, the crew discovers that a Section 31 military intelligence called Control has begun to infiltrate the Federation, and will eventually seek to destroy all organic life in the galaxy. Mira Philippa Giorgio, newly established as a Section 31 operative, works with Ash Tyler and the crew of the Discovery to end the threat, culminating in an all-out ship-to-ship brawl and the sending of the Discovery into the far future, 930 years away from everything it's ever known. Um, I, oh yeah, I'll go first. Uh, season 2 is a mixed season for me. It, I kind of like, in paper, mm. I, I really like a lot of it. I like, that that final battle is iconic. Like, that is, you know, okay, yeah, it's a bit of awesome. a, a clusterfuck of yeah. uh, of drones and swarms and something you don't really see in, uh, in Star Trek, but kind of makes sense, but it is visually stunning. Um, obviously, mm. it gives us Anson Mount, uh, who was just incredible. I will always remember Inspired. that conversation with him and Saru after S- uh, Saru's gone through the Vaharai. It's something along the lines of, you know, well, a half Klingon and a dead guy have never been, you know, in, in, in a fight before on a Starfleet vessel. So I think this breaks protocol. Don't you? Don't you agree? You know, um, I'm not too thrilled about the Section Thirty One stuff. I feel they were a bit too over considering what we'd seen before with them being sort of like very much behind the scenes kind of thing. There was a lot mm. of, uh, you know, the Arium episode bugged me a little bit. It was just like, oh, Arium's going to get her episode, then she'll die. Oh, this person's going to get their episode, and then they'll die. There was a little bit of that. We got Narn in, which was great. Um, the whole, like we mentioned before, you know, Burnham being, you know, the the cause of these Red Angel and her mother being integrated in it as well was a little bit, a little bit too convenient, but we did <coughs> excuse me we did get amazing spock dialogue like there's a lot of ups and downs with this season um there's a lot of the the emotionality as well coming to play in it as well a little bit too much um i think this is kind of where a lot of people's arguments are on that front a lot of people's complaints um i feel like this this definitely set a lot of ground for the future um especially considering they do jump to the future as well which is probably one of the best things for the show um but i i did feel like this was definitely again this was another showrunner 
Um, I don't know their name after Brian Fuller, but this was another show run that then left halfway through production. I think it was well. a pair, yeah. Yeah. Um, which led to Michelle Paradise taking over for the last season, and that was Michelle Paradise all the way through three, four, and five. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm up and down on this series. Uh, we get some more Ash and um, uh, Laurel for mm, not much reason. We do get more evolution of Saru, which is great. This is probably Saru's best character building in this season as well. So uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm mixed on this series. It's it's good in principle but i feel like there's a lot of episodes you kind of go like oh do i like and this is the problem with serialization there's going to be that episode you're going to watch and go like i don't really want to but i kind of have to (laughs) so yeah i'm gonna just jump straight in here because season two up until i just finished season four was my my with a bullet favorite episode uh, favorite season of the entire show um, as you mentioned, Anson Mount is instantly iconic and lovable. Just you know, like that bit on the um, the bridge when he's like getting his uh, uh, the command codes and he, you know, oh, I need to just tweak your finger. Ah, I nearly broke a captain. Just like just instantly cute, instantly charming. Such a departure from Lorca. Lorca. Um, I absolutely love like like all the uh, slightly more classic Trek elements like New Eden. There's a, a great Prime Directive episode. Um, it has some of my favorite character moments in the entire show run. Um, like the fight, like it's it's case of like you know, Tyler is a bit up and down in how he's used in season two. He kind of comes in and comes out, but the fight he has with Culber in the mess hall is so brutal, and it feels very very realistic because they don't go for very long before they get exhausted. But then they have that moment of instant understanding of uh, we have life and death, identity and and mm-hmm. so so emotionally charged, like such a good use of Wilson Cru- uh, Wilson Cruz there. Um. And it has the entire foundational statement for Strange New Worlds in there, with Pike taking the time crystal and saying, you know, I am a Starfleet cat and I believe in love and honor and sacrifice and compassion. I will not, you know, flinch from my duties because it contains a future that I have not seen for myself. Like, that is the ultimate epitome of a Starfleet captain to me. That is the moment I think of now. It's not, you know, it, anyone giving the monologue it's that moment that epitomizes Starfleet to me I love the final seasons like the, 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 the finale I think holds together a, a bit better than season ones and I love the carrier v carrier style fight they've got going on between mm-hmm. controls fleets and stuff like that and guess we'll get and see the, the Enterprise like wreck shit is always good fun um I, I can see where some of the criticism is going but no I, I love season two season two has a lot of love from me auto yeah season, season two is great it's um oh, it's uh, for me. It's not as good as season one, but th- mm. there's more. It's or maybe it's as good, but there's more bad points that I picked out of it, sort of thing with season two. Um, like you say, Pike, the whole Enterprise crew, that and the Telosian episode. I love that episode. Mm. That was brilliant. Oh, so um, good. Yeah, so good. Uh, I feel like it's got both ends yeah, of the spectrum, hasn't it? It's kind of like it's it's great, and then when it's not, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, maybe that's what it is. It's more range. Um, but there's a few... How have we not mentioned Jet Reno yet? <laughs> oh, Jet Reno, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, maybe season two's better than I remember. <laughs> You're trying to keep Jet, Jet Reno was peak. Like, oh, yeah, we got season Jet Reno. Two was yeah, peak we got... Jet Reno. Yeah. yeah, that was top peak Jet Reno. Because when, when the where they find on the uh, is it the high high Hiawatha, yeah. Hiawatha, yeah. That's, that's a great episode, and the way that she's keeping people alive using engineering skills mm-hmm. rather than medical skills. The body's just a, a an engine. Or, or something. And I read. Point, yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, so good. But I did feel like there's a couple of moments throughout the season where they just magic something. The time crystals to me felt a little bit like, oh, we need to travel time, so we'll find a magic crystal, or um, <laughs> they, they need to find a way to make the computer sentient, so we'll just have a magic orb thing floating through space that knows everything ever, and have it. Oh my god, the, the orb! Computer. I forgot about the orb. That was actually kind of cool. Sphere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it did feel like there's a few oh, don't know what to do magic moments. Make the same thing go mad. This magic moment. <laughs> Come on, Otto, you got to give us your view on it. Uh, you've been relieved of hosting duties, Dan. What do you think about season two? <laughs> no, I'll, I'll I'll go ahead. Um, of of the characters who appeared in one and two, Ash Tyler is my favorite. I feel like I'm in the anti shy today because I really like five season five. And I didn't like one. <laughs> I like Ash Tyler. I didn't like the introduction of Tilly. So basically, you know, we're on the opposite side of the fence for most things. But yeah, I found his dual identity intriguing when he needed to be 
threatening or have the 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 edge of threat i kind of bought that um my favorite stuff with burnham in the first two seasons was when she was with ash tyler and then yeah that the section 31 thing you know it's so overdone i don't particularly like section 31 but i thought okay if they're gonna write him off as like all right he he's off to the section 31 farm we might see him once or twice a season moving forward i thought okay i'd like to see that thread carry forward in it and unfortunately wasn't so um i don't have too many things to say but i just want to shout out my boy ash uh, shazad latif and i liked almost everything he did throughout discovery so Shut the fuck up clem fandango <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i mean i think ash is better this season actually because he, because he has more to do with other characters than than burnham he's, he's got the laurel relationship uh Mm -hmm. um but for for me this season it's it's about it's about pike it's about jet reno it's about the house of Sarek. the house of Sarek soap opera in season two is incredible yeah. the burn which destroyed all the dilithium 800 years from now was not an empathic uh saru uh you know character it, it was it was michael burnham dissing spock's beard in that space <laughs> and they carried forward centuries and destroyed all the dilithium in the galaxy uh, it, like yeah you know you it, we, it's upsetting that ariam only got like one featured episode but that's a great episode like what a well a written beautiful episode flashing back to her life going through her memories of the day mm. and showing her deleting all it that's just a beautiful and the and the fights season two way upgraded way upgraded mm. like the fights with arium uh i think michael uses a double fist in the airlock fight <laughs> against yeah. arium a classic kirk uh x x handle um and of course Giorgio is full Giorgio season two she's mm. just cooking with fire here uh yeah you know michael burnham's mom coming in i, I understand how that might feel like a stretch but anytime you can get an actor from The Wire on your show, <laughs> you have to do that. That's just instant legitimacy for your prestige television. She is a very good actress. That, that whole yeah. that whole bit with uh, bringing Burnham's parents in very much reminded me of the uh, Voyager with Seven of Nine and all her oh, parents the studying the Borg. Yeah, yeah, the and it kind of yeah. bring them into this the state the same story. It felt very much <laughs> like that. Yeah, I, I don't think the Burnhams were quite as horrible parents as uh, the Hansons were. <laughs> yeah. hey, let's take our child into the Borg, yeah. <laughs> Borg fleet. Um, I didn't like that they killed Cornwall. Cornwall? I, I didn't think... A shout out to my girl, Katrina Cornwall. She's one Jeez. of the best Ambrils we've ever had in all the Star Trek. Great. I would have loved to have seen her as, at the end in the epilogue as part of the uh, Discovery cover-up. Uh, you know, mm. lying to Starfleet about the existence, mm. existence of Discovery. Non's a great addition. You know, it's it's tough to add... Adding new characters to the series is tough. And once again, the writer's room with Non, and especially with Jet Reno and with the the Strange New Worlds crew, just nails it. They nailed the casting. They nailed the the costumes for them. It was, it was just really uh, extraordinary. And my, my favorite scene in the, the series, even like Poe from the Short Treks was was an adorable addition and my favorite uh, scene cool, is yeah. when yeah. is when all the the brains of the ship are sitting around trying to uh, brainstorm solutions and Giorgio jo like like mentions genocide or something and then like she's like I thought there were no bad ideas and she's like no there are bad ideas <laughs> like genocide <laughs> it worked for Cisco so you know yeah, exactly. <laughs> he can live with it Dan, go ahead and finish us off for 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 season two here. Yeah, so this this is a kind of unique season that it it also, it, and I'm not sure if they were aware at the time if this was going to be kind of a, a rough pilot for Strange New Worlds. Um, you know, cer certainly I'm sure they always have their options open when they bring on you know a number of new new crew members. Um, but also it was a it was a kind of a reverse serialization. There was a lot of standalone episodes that we found out 
at the very end were all tied together in, in, in part two of, of the finale. And so it was kind of interesting to, to see them draw all these loose threads together. So that I really enjoyed. I think the two-parter was a bit much. I think it could have been done in one. I think the first one was full of padding. And, you know, for all the glamour shots of the spaceships and all the building tension aside, you know, it really felt like as much of a nothing burger as, and I hate to say it as Best of Both Worlds Part 1 did to me. You know, we're just spending 42 minutes only just building up to one, you know, seminal plot point. Fine. What? Okay. what? You know, yeah, 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 yeah. This part two is better. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I really, I really enjoyed uh, New Eden. It was just a fantastic episode, and what I thought was a standalone episode, but it, it turned out to be integrated into the whole plot of the series, of course. And um, and really, uh, you know, just even even the there was a minor character. I think his name was Jacob in that episode. It just really just what a what a fantastic actor. Yeah, he's like the really, the um, the guy who works all the technology in the church. Oh, yeah. yeah, and he gets the glimpse of of what 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 the, what the truth is and you just feel for him so much and so they when they want to do when they want to do a good solid standalone Star Trek show they can absolutely still deliver and that's in there and that kept me going you know and, and you know I'm, I'm looking I haven't watched all the episodes from season two I'm actually looking forward to watching more and, and kind of seeing more of it and and actually I think it'll only benefit the fact that I know how the season ends going back and going through with that knowledge I think will make the rewatch even more interesting can I just can I just Bring him. This, this is probably the, my worst part of season two is the Kolba coming back to life through the mycelial network part. I thought that was very strange, mm. and then yeah. them not ever mentioning it again, as in <laughs> well, that, they're not they don't they don't study it and say, "Well, we can like, bring oh, people shit, back to life." Oh shit! Everyone likes this character. Ooh. Mm. Yeah, uh. <laughs> but, it's, but, but then they didn't go. The scientists didn't go. Well, we can bring people back to life now. Let's use that for other times people get killed. They just went, "Oh, we brought him back. That's a thing." I think they do some mumbo jumbo in the episode to establish why they can't do it for other people. But to be fair, like, even though they mm. don't go into the ramifications of that for like in terms of like, the science, all the character work they do with him, like in terms of his feeling numb and his sensations and like missing yeah. his scars, like I yeah. love all that stuff. Um, and I can tell what was going to horror me all, and I'm I'm going to get to season three. But I have to shout well, out well, one of my favorite. Before moments. you get there, let let me pick up because I agree with Cranky there, okay. and that's one of my issues with Discovery is, um, you know. We we can we can use the spore drive and jump wherever, but no one else can do it. We can bring Culber back, but then we'll make a reason why no one else can do it. We can use time crystals crystals because they're cool, and then no one else can do it. And it's like, well, if you're going to introduce something to the lore, but then no one else can do it, it it feels like a cheat code, you know. It, it, so I mean, um, they didn't fully really explain it. They just thought, well, my serial network. Yeah, so <laughs> if you're going to introduce something cool, like leave it open for future shows to do, or, or, or you know, mm. I don't well, know. Well, that's Whatever. that was also a problem with episodic Star Trek, right? Like, there's constantly, there's a hundred ways for people to come back to life in the Star Trek universe. The Black Mountain. Over, over all the franchises, right? <laughs> like, why isn't every ship just flying around with a tantalus field just eliminating everyone in their enemy ship yeah, yeah. across from them, like at the press yeah. of a button? There's well, a million technologies. Yeah, you're right. Although back. for TOS, I'm going to give them a pass because in that era, they would create whatever bullshit they want with no Trek, no babble, and like <laughs> that was the norm. So did it in the cave for the box of scraps. If, if, you know, if we're going to get them credit credit for smart writing and smart civilization in the current year, then they gotta kind of leave those tropes to the side. I think. Mm. Um, See, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna shout out like the, my favorite one of my favorite moments of season two, which is just like the visual representation of uh, Burnham going through the wormholes as uh, the Red Angel, and mm. like the the red the red shift, and like the it's like in terms of I have never seen this effect done before. I can kind of tell how you're doing it, but just in terms of like articulating to me in a visual medium something I've never seen before and can't understand how it would go through fucking revolutionary for me all right so am i good to yeah, go they to saw, three? Yeah. saw it yeah i was just gonna say they saw interstellar in 2014 and they were like let's do that <laughs> for season, <laughs> season two. all right moving on season three um charting a course through a new century where no track has gone before discovery season three establishes a radical new status quo where the federation is completely fractured warp drive is all but impossible and the Orion organization known as the Emerald Chain threatens what little remains of the Federation. A soft reboot of the show, season three focuses more on establishing Discovery's newest setting, its newest crew members, including Cleveland Booker and Adira Tal, and tasks the crew with solving the burn. 
It all comes to a head in a tense confrontation about a uh, hijacked USS Discovery as the crew fights off Osira and struggles to come to an understanding with the cause of the shockwave that disconnected most of the known galaxy from each other. Now, as you guys give your thoughts on the season, I would also like a yes or no, no equivocation, a yes or no, and give your best guess. Uh, this time jump to the future, should Discovery have started in a current era so they don't have to worry about things like canon or, or, or neat effects? Or do you think starting in the past and jumping forward was, was the right way to do it? It's a hard question, really, because I think there's a lot of stuff that was established in their attitudes in uh, in those earlier seasons to how they're received in season three. I think like a lot of the a lot of the tension that is that should have been in season three should have been that they're outsiders and they are relics of the past. But and I think uh, you know I'm going to say no because it added it added some drama but it, the drama wasn't there and i'll get into that because season three again like season two is a, a season of two halves for me because i was very excited going into this because we're going 32nd century this is what star trek fans we want the, to go into that future that area that no one's ever gone before uh but we for myself being a law buff and someone that wants to see like right what's the state of the galaxy what's going on out there what are the dominion doing where are the borg what are the klingons doing we don't really get any of that in this season we get a little bit of the federation how it's fractured and splintered they don't have warp drive but they do they can't really assist any other members but discovery can because of the spore drive so it suddenly went from discovery were kind of outsiders to this universe like a thousand years in the future they should have been radically different yet it was all too familiar everything was still there's still a starfleet headquarters there is still humans being humans okay president rilak is a, a nice combination of human bajoran and cardassian there's some interesting plot story maybe we could delve into how that that, that got together like navarre we got into the romulan vulcan reunification but you know some of the more interesting conversations like you know where are the lines blurred it felt very tos and that we didn't know where the Federation was. We didn't know how big. It wasn't established. It was more like, okay, Sahil was, uh, you know, monitoring his little station out somewhere completely devoid from the Federation. But next, and by the end of the series, he's he's back on board. Discovery was suddenly like the most important ship in the Federation. And they're just accepted as another crew. There was no reintegration. There was no, like, here's what's changed. There was no kind of, um, n none of the crew ever felt like, they felt lost because you know they're 930 years away from the future and there were a couple of scenes where a couple of people yeah you know, I, can't, I can't remember specifically i think culber and tilly specifically were like i don't know what i'm doing here we're so far away from home but we never felt like anyone felt ostracized um we got cleveland booker cleveland booker was cool i like him he's a great character uh, burnham's whole whole thing about her being a courier was very cool and a nice like you say a nice way to reboot and reset a character to being very unsure and i like the stories with her trying to be a first officer and not fitting in that was great but the biggest part where this season falls over is not where you might expect a lot of people have complaints about the source of the burn i actually like the fact it was a subspace attuned kelpie and that who, his mother died and blew out all of subspace because he happened to be on a dilithium rich planet i think that makes perfect sense that's great i really like that um and i really like the story of saru no discovery. To space scientist idol absolutely Dude, that's the most star trek fan thing i've ever said it's like oh yeah that makes perfect <laughs> that's sense. Makes, that makes sense to me I, I've, I've screamed and taken out the lights it's fine anyway um but uh you know it is great for well, saru hold on, we're whole... not gonna gloss over that did you blow out a light bulb from screaming did you actually no shut up anyway shut up I'm trying to make a point <laughs> that's because you weren't on a dilithium rich planet otherwise you would have been able to do it. whatever you can tell i'm talking without thinking right now anyway um saru's journey into um you know discovering him in that whole sort of like holodeck ship was very cool but uh, it kind of falls down with not just the you know the infinite uh turbo lift that can shoot through uh the discovery like oh, it's yeah. a, a, a small oh, city that? yeah that was weird um but it's also the fact that the orions are just not a convincing threat at all you know the federation mm. are being you know beaten by the orions at this point but we you know they have this huge juggernaut but i don't know it osira never felt like a good villain to me and it didn't feel like there was any kind of credibility they wanted the spore drive but um it, it i don't know there's something about this season that feels like it had the potential to introduce different kind of drama and explore a world and have discovery earn their right to be 
a part of this federation that is struggling and trying to rebuild and then all of a sudden you know and this stretches into one of my complaints for season four as well is like all of a sudden like yeah people are coming back into the federation the gang's back together in the space of like five episodes they got trill vulcan and earth all to join you know it's like it felt rushed without kind of considering the stakes that are actually there i said my piece <laughs> i'm going to disagree with you on the on the uh the cause of the burn i didn't like that i thought that was after the after the big build up of this huge cataclysmic event that's taken out all of the dilithium across the galaxy and and it turns out to be a guy that was screaming on a dilithium planet i, I don't know that felt like a bit of a letdown to me um season season three in general is my least favorite season um what was the question that we ought to ask i had to give a yes the, or no the time to. jump to the future do you think discovery should have always started in the future set there or do you think the the half and half kind of works for the the series no i yeah i, I would have been happy with it to stay in the past to be honest um but I'm, I'm down with it being split I, that's, that's not an issue for me I quite like that um, and I'm glad that they didn't jump to another era another known era um, they've gone completely yeah. into the future where they can just do anything new and it doesn't matter now, no one can claim that it's not their trek anymore because they changed something or, you know, I thought that, that's, that's fine um, yeah, I don't know, Discovery it, it, season 3 was, it felt, it felt like a bit of a letdown after the first two seasons I thought, I was um, pumped after the first two seasons. It felt I don't a bit think I've ever safe. said the word pump before. <laughs> it felt it, it, it did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but then oh. we got the introduction of some great characters. You've got Vance, Admiral Vance, oh, yeah. who's a great character. Um, we get Tarina, who comes into it. Uh, Booker, obviously, is a great character. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It's, it's, it's my least favorite of the season. So I got Booker here. I got grudge here, sorry. Hey, grudge. Oh, yeah, no, no, you're, you're grudge, grudge, Dan. Grudge yeah. us. <laughs> so I'll be honest, I haven't I haven't watched a lot of season three, but I, I do have kind of a bone to pick with the fact that it just seems like every season Burnham has to have a love interest, and that just, you know, is mm. is really just kind of a, a departure. And I suppose it's another another choice the writers and the showrunners have made that, you know, we're going to make Discovery a lot more about the interpersonal relationships, and, uh, you know, to, to that effect, we're going to, Oh, you always have a love interest right there present for for Burnham to be involved with, um, and at the very least, you know we've got a family member in, in season two, and uh, you know Tyler was still there. He came in a little bit more at the end, but but now you know we've got the the through line for the next three seasons of Booker, and uh, you know just I, I would like to see her be able to connect with her crew more. And when you have a love interest always there, kind of in the background, stealing scenes, it makes it real difficult for for those connections to her crew to happen, and that's also what makes it a little bit more difficult for me to become invested in this season so yeah like uh, season three so an answer to your question Otto, while i think that you could very easily rewrite discovery so that seasons one and two fit into the 32nd century and it wouldn't you wouldn't sacrifice too much i wouldn't want to lose the seasons one and two that we got i feel like i really like season one and season two and they do a decent enough like um, writing job to justify why they've done the choices that they've made. But it's like, guess what? If we don't have season two of Discovery, we don't know Strange New Worlds, and that's not a sacrifice I'm willing to make. Mm. Um, and you know what? I'm going to be controversial. I really like Adira, and I actually really like, um, at the very least, like the opening stages of the Adira and Grey romance. I know that it's like, it, it drags for people, and I can understand why. But especially for me as someone who has a trans boyfriend, getting to see that representation on screen after stuff like, you know, Trek had gone there in places. It had done The Outcast and it had done Rejoined. <laughs> it had gone there as lightly um, as they could possibly do, but <laughs> while still being able to air it on television. Yeah. They, they put a main coon paw down onto the dough and they left an imprint and then they pulled back. Yeah. Um, and then here it's like, no fuck you forget me not which is my favorite episode of season three is all about trill who have always been a lgbt allegory like, let's examine you know transphobia and like you know, like and like, like misogyny within the lgbt community which is all an allegory for adira's whole thing and i just really enjoy 
everything that goes on in the episode and I enjoy where that goes a lot. Osiris sucks. She's not great. I feel like the actress is okay. She could have done better with what she got, but I was way more invested in the stuff with Sukal and getting to see human Saru and all good, of yeah. that stuff on like there's some really cool stuff in there. And then it's like you're kind of getting a bit of a rehash diehard plot on board the Discovery, mm. and it's fine, but it's not mm. great. Um, it, it's yeah. It, although th there's individual parts I really, really love. But although like, the, yeah. the Mirror Universe two parter is excellent. That is uh, oh, it's so good. Carl is so cool. Mirror Burnham. That is uh, like, that could be its own. Forever. That could be the Carl. Section thirty one film. Just take that out. It's its own little movie. It's fine. Mm. I love Carl. Like yes, what Carl is <laughs> fucking awesome. He's one of my favorite like minor characters. I love Kovic. Kovic yeah. is one of my favorite characters in Discovery. I really you love mean... him and his performance. I, I, I used to like Kovic. Yes. Yeah. I mean, do Truman mean Kovic. Agent Daniels? <laughs> Truman Truman Daniels. He's become yeah. so much cooler. Guess what? He grew into a way cooler character. We should all aspire to be as cool as him. Um, and yeah, guess what? Sonequa Martin Green, when she does, like, when she has all the fucking eyeliner on and the blood across her throat and she's going full fucking Joker. <laughs> so fucking good so fucking good just <laughs> incredible a revelation we got weird like mirror performance art with the the tapestries just like so high drama everyone got a little bit of something to do just yeah now, season three it's like individual bits are some of the best bits of any of the show but as a whole it doesn't quite hold together which is a bit of a shame mm. yeah I, I i have a similar uh take on season three look when you're when your antagonist is not super strong as is the mm. case with uh osira here having the orions as the big bad is not a bad wait mm. that's this season right yeah it's not a bad it's not yeah, a yeah, bad yeah. thing the but they, they, they even, didn't yeah. her best scene was the one where she's kind of negotiating for yeah. the merger right with the federation yeah uh, and vance is telling her how like the apple she's eating is made out shit, of you know feces <laughs> um <laughs> uh, and she's like, oh, yeah, I know I'm a war criminal, but I, I, I have this great vision, progressive vision for our future. Oh, I have to pay for my crimes? Oh, no, 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 I can't. can't <laughs> oh, do that. yeah, that's so good. That. So uh, good. I love, <laughs> what? I, love that, yeah, I love that Star Trek was like, oh, Star Wars can get Werner Herzog? Yeah, we're going to get David Cronenberg <laughs> to be uh, Dr. Kovic. His, uh, his debut with uh, like debriefing all the Discovery cast and that scene with him and... Uh, Giorgio is spectacular where she she mm. uh, she she freaks out the, the android or the hologram uh, yeah. just by blinking at it in a way that will disrupt oh, yeah, its yeah. recognition patterns. Oh, man. Um, yeah, that Terran two parters. The, the little uh, line. No, because uh, Giorgio screwed him up. I know. Because <laughs> Giorgio just <laughs> messed him up down to like the bits. That's why. Uh, yeah, so Nico <laughs> Martin Green quietly has like some of her best acting in the entire series between the Terran two-parter and just her reaction the, her reaction of relief to having it having worked to get to the 32nd century when she lands in the pilot episode oh, yeah. is just, yeah. just very palpable um and also um, when she gets dosed with the drugs oh dang yeah yeah, yeah. she does hydrate <laughs> it's like it's like you were saying Dan like when, when when she's allowed to shift between like deadly serious and casual and fun that's when that character really sings. Um, yeah, the Guardian of Forever stuff is great. Uh, Vance is an amazing introduction. The futurism in 32nd century, uh, a lot of it's great. A lot of it's like, why are they still using this? Like, they're they're still using photon torpedoes, right? Like, why aren't we yeah. up to quantum <laughs> torpedoes at this point or, or so, some other thing? I know there was a dark, like a technological dark ages, but it shouldn't go back to 23rd century it should at least go back mm. to 20, 26th 27th century technology um yeah i really much appreciated the introduction of tall and and gray yeah that relationship did drag on and later but that wasn't the problem this season this season it was fine mm. Mm. uh and the complaints about them not visiting other member federation worlds and sort of like revisiting uh, those other species i get that that's a problem that arises in later seasons that should be happening in four that definitely should have been happening in five uh where you're leading a merry chase through the galaxy and somehow don't visit any of these other worlds but we'll talk about that more when we get this season um mm -hmm. so yeah this is my uh like 
fourth favorite season of the series. <laughs> Um, so I, I've watched all season three and almost none of it has stuck with, with me. <laughs> you know, when doing the prep for this, I went back, memory alpha, I'm going episode by episode. I'm like, I don't remember any of this happening. So, you know, apparently it didn't leave a big mark on me, but I will shout out two characters slash actors, Rin, AKA and Noah, AK, who oh, came yeah. on this show. So he's automatically a fucking baller and <laughs> Cleveland Booker. Um, is it Ayala or Ajala, David? Ajala. David, oh, I, I believe it's Ayala. Yeah. I thought it was right. Ayala. Anyways, I love Cleveland Booker, and what mm. what appeals to me a lot is he's he's nuanced, and he's a good compliment because to this point in the in the show, and then into season four, one of my big complaints was the over emotionality, the saccharine writing and acting, and he comes in and he just like he fits with them. Mm. But it's a good compliment because he doesn't go there with his acting, but he's still believable. Uh, when he wants to emote, he can emote just fine. So I I thought pairing him with, with SMG was a good fit. I can understand why you wouldn't want, you know, every season to have a love story, but I just think they work well together and it brings out the best in her. So I, I like him overall. Oh, Any final shit, thoughts, yeah, too? Great hey, one ship. One thing I'd like to mention is it's something that Emma brought up because she's recently had a rewatch of it. Is during season three, Saru character changes slightly. He starts to become more of a almost counselor, and she, the way she described mm. it, is, I'd never thought of it this way. Is he's like Guinan but without the funny and the good bits. He kind of comes <laughs> in, just says says a few random words, and then just goes again, and that's it. Everything's fixed. <laughs> so, yeah, and I, I, I kind of agree with that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure we're going to have time to get S to tiering today, so I'll I'll say now what I was going to say about Saru, who is an S-tier character. As I look back, uh, think about the five seasons, literally the only complaint I have about this character and actor is the nose prosthetic makes him sound like he has his nose plugged. That's the only yeah. nit that I can pick with this character. Everything else about him, you know, the physicality, the uh, just uh, whatever. It's all good, so I, I, I absolutely yeah. adore Saru. Yeah, he, he's an anchor almost every season. Yeah, he's one of my favorites. Yeah, he was. Has, he, he always has the best one-liners. Like when he was like, "Captain Killy." Well, that's a little on the nose. Or, <laughs> <laughs> or what was the other? When when he was like scolding the the crew for not having studied other languages in in the academy. Am I the only one who bothered? <laughs> Give another foreign language. Yeah, yeah it's great. Yeah. All right, stars, go ahead and move us into season four. Further exploring the 32nd century, Discovery Season 4 is perhaps the most hard sci-fi Trek season of them all, using its highly serialized format to construct a full narrative of first contact, from fledgling disastrous steps as Booker's homeworld, Quajan, is destroyed, all the way to a triumphant end past the galactic barrier, as the Discovery crew successfully connect with a species known as the 10C. Spotlighting almost every member of the crew, even as it pits uh, them against each other in a battle of idealism versus pragmatism, this journey through a mending but still fractious federation introduces Ruan Tarka, President Rillac, and develops multiple uh, romances, including series sweethearts Saru and Tarina. OTP. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. This is my favorite series of Star Trek, yeah. like one of the top in Star Trek, because this, the, and I'm going to mention the, the cursed word here, but this reminds me so much of the motion picture where it's going up against something so completely unknown that they can't mm. even figure, you know, they, it takes them a while to figure out what they, what it is and how to even contact with them. This this series is, is, is really good. It's really like the Excel, it excels the format of Discovery up to, uh, to full notches. Like we have you know, we introduced, you know, we've got Rilak who comes in, you actually see the president who is very nuanced in herself and, you know, calls Burnham out on her shit. We even have like Narn coming back to call Burnham out on her shit as well. There's a lot of analysis of Burnham in this season because she is now a captain. Um, you know, so she, you know, there's a lot of like, you know, your command style and what you've done in the past and things like that. We also get Saru coming back as a captain as well. We have co-captains on the bridge, which is is really fun. It's really great because like, you know that Saru is a great commander, so you don't have that whole kind of like, oh, the first officer's in charge. We don't know what's going to happen. There's a couple of episodes. You know, there's a few standalone episodes in there, including one where they get lost in a subspace rift. Um, and they have to work their way out. There's another episode where, almost a measure of a man, Zora has to prove her 
um, capabilities mm. as a, a life form and to be a member of the crew. There's a cas- there's a fun casino hijinks episode, uh, which is, yeah, is, I is that incredibly one. just fun. Um, but you also have one of my favorite antagonists in the series, well, and Taka, uh, Ruon Taka, mm. who is so he's not a villain. Like we were having this conversation earlier, Ruon Taka is not a villain. He's an antagonist. He is almost, you know, just a conflicted scientist who's trying to get back to his love, his friend, to go to a different universe, to have this power. He's very emotionally driven. He's the actor who gets him. He's brilliant as well. He plays. He's so snarky. He is very like he's a lot of fun to watch and to engage with. He doesn't Sean feel. Doyle. Yeah, he doesn't feel malicious. But, you know, at the end of the day, we, we you know, at the end of the series as well, we get the Ten C who are a remarkable species, such a departure from something that Star Trek's ever done before. And it's the the fact that they are not villains in themselves, they cause a lot of destruction across the Federation, which is a lot of people's complaints to say, Oh, it's another save the galaxy thing. And I kinda disagree a little bit because okay, it mm. is, but it also it's all it's more about first contact and it's more about the differences between like they are such you know they're on the Kardashev scale they are like this type 2 civilization that can mold entire stars. I love systems. seeing that get called out yeah yeah it's so good I love that kind of hard sci-fi approach and they kind of like once you get through to them they are you find out they are empathetic they didn't realize they were stepping on ants you know and they realize these ants actually have entire colonies that have scientific advancements that could get to where they are and that's that it it, it ends really well you know it ends with uh, what Star Trek is about, which is about discovery, which is about empathy, which is about um, unity, and it, it's I I, lo- I love this series for what it is. It has a few, you know, little tight tightrope bits where it is, you know, there's the whole Javini thing, and you know, uh, that, that's not a, a hugely great episode. And there's a few bits where you can tell they're kind of spinning their wheels, um, uh, just trying to, you know, they they do the science thing, and the science thing gets done. Yay, science! We did it. And there's a little bit like, oh, we're all friends of the Federation, aren't we? Yeah, here's my backstory. <laughs> you know, I'm Miss Bridge. We, we've we've registered these complaints about the bridge officers. Well, I'm really into surfing. That's great. And back he goes off to the back of the bridge. Um, but apart from that, <laughs> it's a really good series. I love it. I think we should probably bounce this to Dan because I think he might have to go soon. Yeah, actually, I'm just gonna I'm gonna cop out here and leave it all to you. But uh, yeah, I you know I I have to say I'm really glad for the time I spent putting into Discovery. I, far and away, I think I'm most glad for Doug Jones. He really deserved to get the attention he did and just knocked it out of the park with this series. Every single time he's on screen, he's just magnetic. And uh, those of us in the know have known his work for a very long time, and I'm glad that the the general public is now aware of him. Um, and what he can really bring to a role. Uh, um, you know, uh, Otto, thank you for tasking me with, <laughs> he tasks me with uh, <laughs> with watching Discovery. Because uh, just go. despite my, my misgivings and, and initial stumbling on this, I, I really do feel like I'm better for the journey. And it's really, uh, you know, opened up my eyes to a different kind of Star Trek that I really do have a better appreciation for. Um, so with that, I'll leave you all. Thank you so much for inviting me to the stream and, and good luck Bye, talking man. about the rest of this crap. Let's come on, man. <laughs> The floor is open, gentlemen. All right, I'll uh, jump in here because oh. I don't have positive things to say, and I don't want to be the last one this time. Because I, because I did like season five, and we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so this is just about where I ju- I fell off the bandwagon with Discovery. Um, uh, it was Star Trek Burnham, and because I didn't like Burnham, I you know, I just wasn't having it. So I, I started the season. I watched season uh, uh, episode one, and. I just fell off. I'm like, well, you know, I wasn't excited for episode two. And I ended up not watching it. Um, and then uh, I guess shortly after the season ended, I uh, I, I was talking with Idol and he goes, well, you know, try try the, the season finale because I know you don't like Burnham, but it's a good it's a good ensemble episode. Give it a shot. Maybe you'll like it. So I did. And there's 30, se- 30 scenes in the season finale. 18 of them have Burnham, and she cries twice. So I'm like, okay, I get what you mean. There's a little bit of info about them, but it is exactly the same. Uh, the issues I've had with previous seasons, like, encapsulated there. So in, in getting ready for, for this whole breakdown, I thought, you know, I'm going to give season four another chance because uh, I'd, I'd watched five, and I liked it. I went back to four, and the introduction there... Uh, Burnham and Booker beam down to a planet for a, a first contact, essentially. And the alien there um, has this line, you brought something you think we need, along with a tantalizing offer to help yourselves 
to our technological bounty, all for the low, low price of no strings attached. And I just couldn't get past it. This is terrible. This is this is Galaxy Quest dialogue. It's fourth wall breaking. And it mocks what I love about Star Trek, which is meeting new life forms, genuine diplomacy, trying to see each other's point of view. And it just felt like it was taking the piss to say, we're not like other Trek, you know, and I just couldn't get past it. So I've seen the first and last episodes. I didn't like it. I'm going to go back one day eventually and watch it, but I just, you know, not being able to get past those stumbling blocks um, was unfortunate for me. I can go. I'm busy at the site as right this moment. Oh, 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 yeah, sure. I'll go. I, I, I yeah, I really, I really liked this season. Actually, I, th I thought it was one of their most solid arc stories of the friend of the the series. Uh, the aliens, the Ten C. That's a great alien creation. It's, it's, it's their close encounters. They do close encounters in this season better mm -hmm. than the motion picture does. You know, close encounters was seventy seven. Uh, TMP was 79. They kind of tried it there. Didn't didn't quite work. But here, it's like after Close Encounters, we get to go and meet those aliens, and they're really different than us, and uh, they you know, communicate through smell and light. <laughs> um, Tarka, you say he's like not a villain, but he's kind of just a, a calmer Tolian Soren. Like, he's just yeah. concerned with yeah, his right. happiness at the expense of <laughs> everything else in the galaxy mm -hmm. i just gotta get back and they kind of repeat this in season five with maul and Locke a little bit like i'm just concerned with my love i don't care about you know let the rest of the the galaxy burn i'm just concerned with saving my my love um but yeah the saru trina Tarina story is is wonderful <laughs> i like at the end of this series you know this this is this is quiet really good futurism from star trek the the depiction of criminal justice reform here like booker doesn't get thrown in a federation work camp for the rest of their life they're like you have these skills you're going to use these skills to better society and we're going to talk mm -hmm. to you about maybe where you went wrong discuss this with you and actually rehabilitate you and and let you contribute to society it's not just it it's it's quiet but it's wonderful um and there's that great scene between them where He's teaching her pronunciation, and she's like, "I said it right," <laughs> and he backs off. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I really like this season. Could there have been more um, Federation races featured? Sure, uh, but again, they, you know, it's new that they're just now getting contact with other Federation worlds. So uh, I'll give them a pass for that one. But yeah, yeah. So season four is probably my second favorite season i think mm. uh, after season one um i loved the the hard sci-fi edge with these the tensi and the, uh, the complete unknown like shy said the communication the way they communicate and, um tarka i didn't like tarka <laughs> uh, i don't know i think but but I think that is a compliment to the actor because I think he played the part so well mm -hmm. that he made me not like him. Um, but yeah, like like Shai said, he wanted to. He didn't care. He would burn the galaxy to get what he wanted to get. So I, I don't know. I, I didn't. I, I I see him more as a villain um, than just an antagonist. I think um, there was a, there was one episode that kind of stood out to me a little bit. It was more of a bottle episode. It was the one with Pilly takes a group of cadets and they go onto this ice mm. planet and and you've got like a Bajoran, a, uh, a Talarite, um, there's like one of various different species. I thought that was quite a cool little, as a classic Trek trope. Um, mm. Obviously they go out on a training mission, it all goes wrong, they have to pull together. I thought that was quite a cool little um, classic Trek trope. Mm. So... Um... I, I had to pull another um, kind of an all-nighter to watch all of season four. Um, so I watched uh, episodes one through seven with Brody. Uh, we were having a really good time. And then it was like, okay, I'm, I had a really rough work week. I have to basically get through the rest of my mess myself. I clocked out at five o'clock in the morning this morning. 
and I watched the final episode right before we started you know, this, essentially. Um, this is now my favorite season of Skip Free. Um, and I didn't think it would really be possible for it to be topping season two, because like season two has 70 elements that I love. But it just, it's so committed. Like, well, so you mentioned that bit in the beginning, and it's like, like looking back on it, yeah, it, it, there is a little bit of a, a dismissiveness, I suppose, to it, um, to that encounter. And yeah, I, I think about the rest of the season, and it is so committed to the sanctity of first contact and the debate between greeting with a gun in hand or greeting with an open palm. Um, there's an entire debate about that, and like entire an entire episode about just do we go with you know violently shut this down or do we you know take the time to do this rationally and risk lives and then it's it's the most star trip discussion you could possibly have it's literally idealism versus pragmatism idealism should win every time and yet um i appreciate just how much focus every individual character got like detmo got so much more to do in season four than she ever did in season five mm. um Awushikun's focus in the gambling episode was <laughs> so fucking good. Fucking it's Joan Oh Wow Awushikun. <laughs> there's a cell, there's, so there's a kayfabe, good. there's everything. Oh, is that is that the boxing where she goes yeah, boxing? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. All in a while. That's good. Yeah, yeah. So good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's like it's it's very Star Warsy, right down to like the, the character designs, <laughs> to like you know, having to do like a, a game of basically Sabak, but. It's done in such a way that I don't really mind that it's Star Wars. It just feels like a an homage episode, like like the outrageous Sakona, but done with such a better budget and more fun going on. Um, and just like everything with the Ten C is fascinating. It feels mm. just so much more interested in. Let's do a like actual breakdown of how, how does this go down. It's like the hydrocarbons, the pheromones, the light sequences. Building a link language is so fucking cool. They've realized we don't have a language that we can share with you in common. We have to build one in between. And then, like, the whole... Everything on the fake bridge with um, Saru and Burnham and uh, Rilak and Tarina, and they're debating, like, how do we communicate that we're a different form of life? How do we communicate that we're oxygen-breathing like species? Um, do we... Get the, 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 the atomic number for oxygen? You know, it's like... How do we communicate that we are not all a hive mind? How do we communicate this? How do we communicate that? And then it's all keyed through the pheromone. I'm like, this is so fucking cool. Mm. This is what I wish more Star Trek would do. And it's just like, they outright say the Universal Translator, which is arguably a crutch of the series. Like, there is so little emphasis on communication and translation in, in, the, in the series. Apart from, like, you know, like with stuff with Hoshi and stuff with Ahura. It's relatively disincentivized. It's like to see it drill down into, which is so refreshing. Um, I really enjoyed the character of Doctor Harai. Um, yeah, he's only in like two or three episodes, but he has like he's he's a really fun character. He just feels like this oddball Federation scientist. He does crosswords. Like, <laughs> Rilak is one of my favorite Burnham foils because she's like she's almost like a Laura Roslin from from BSG oh, yeah, and like yeah. balancing that Ria politic versus like feeling like she actually gives a fuck like a federation politician you you see more of a federation pol politician in this entire season of discovery than you do in almost any other star trek series combined you see so much more of the federation in that respect um vance and tilly's like you're having drinks while like the, the the headquarters is about to go go like blow up is great <laughs> cool i love moment. that like you get so little tilly in the season yet it's all done so well um i appreciated like you mentioned, uh, I think um, Dan mentioned how Booker wasn't getting scenes with anyone other than Burnham. There's a whole thing with him connecting with Culver and Stamets, which is such a good use of their characters. Um, there's just so much to dig into in this in the season. And you know, I'm going to fly back on you. I actually really like Tarka. Um And it's probably because um, he's he's a Tony Stark character. He, he can't stand to be wrong. Um... And then you get the peel back of why he's like that, of why he can't be wrong. And it's because he is a gay man who is in love with a person who has died. And guess what? Resonates a bit. I can, I can, I can vibe with why he couldn't let go. 
and the fact that he consistently he, he never kills anyone like not directly I can't think of any time he actually shoots someone or like you know he kidnaps Reno they feed her licorice so she's alright um, which is a great scene for Reno I really appreciated her dynamic there um I really appreciated the fa- I, how consistently they write book and just he straddles the line. He never does anything outright villainous, mm. but he he pushes it. He pushes it real hard. Um, and I just appreciate that it's like there's no bad guys here. The Ten C aren't bad guys. Tarkit isn't a bad guy. He's not doing it because he wants to hurt people. He's doing it because the universe fucked him over so hard that he can't con- he can't conceive of a world in which he doesn't do that to other people. That's his problem solving like mechanic. And it's just like there's so much to dig into in season 4. I really enjoy it. And obviously slightly colored by the fact that I've just watched it obviously. But in terms of its commitment to Star Trek, it just feels so pure. Uh I like it a lot more than season 5. Um and you know, we'll we'll get into that now. Yeah. But yeah, that's my feeling on season 4. I really like season 4. Season 4 is great. I have one small grudge again with this one. Mm. They magic it again. They get Booker dies. He gets killed on the ship. It explodes, and, and then the Ten C sort of go, "Oh, you like him? Oh, here you go." Have him I back. think that was just more a demonstration. Like, yo, this is how much further they are advanced. Like, oh, we found this signal. Yeah. We don't know what it is. Is it? Does it belong to you? Okay, there it is. You know, it was. I, I, I didn't mind. Yeah. That. They so were magic. It would be like, one thing if he. Had... <laughs> I love having. It would be one thing if it was a case of. Well, no, here you go. I was just going to say, I loved having Stacey Abrams as the president of Earth. And that as well, yeah. By the way. <laughs> but what were you going to say? Uh... Oh, I was going to say, it would be one thing if, like, you see the ship blow up and then Booker just appears. But they do a lot of legwork to show Tarka beaming yeah. him off. We can't get a signal and then it goes away. So it's like, I feel like that's earned. <coughs> Ooh, sorry, I'm dying. Um, but yeah, no, like, it's... If there had been more um, seasons like Discovery, like I would be so much sadder, and I would feel like such a man, like, such an asshole for having missed out on it. I really feel like I, I did myself a disservice for not watching it when it came out. I don't, I don't know why I didn't. I kept telling you, watch season four. <laughs> you did. <laughs> you told me, but I didn't believe you. Mm. True. All right, on to season uh, five. We have uh, scavenger hunt story arc. Punctuated, I think, by uh, probably the most episodic of, of the five seasons. There are a lot of standalone episodes where they kind of tether with an epilogue and a prologue to the overarching story. We get Raynor in as Burnham's first officer. Uh, we get the, the Bonnie and Clyde characters of Maul and Locke. And Saru and Tarina, their relationship there. So I'm going to uh, ask, uh, because we waffled on on that for, for three hours last week. So I'm going to just ask Shy and Cranky their thoughts on season five. I, I know you were with us in chat, but um, go ahead, Shy. Tell us what you, because yeah, you were a little bit cooler on season five. Yeah, this is a great story idea for a season. Like, just bringing back the chase, a treasure hunt, you know, give me some Dragon Balls, give me some uh, Jackie Chan <laughs> adventures. Uh, put put together your, your Triforce, whatever, whatever you want to do. It's just a good, solid trope to come back to. And the first two episodes are great. You know, I'm a little colored. I saw it in a theater at the New York City premiere with Sonequa <laughs> Martin-Green and Wilson Cruz. They're you both friends to me, uh, yeah. More, uh, yeah. yeah, more attractive than you could possibly imagine any human being can be in person. Like, you're like, why am I this close to this AI-generated person in 3D? It shouldn't exist. <laughs> um, but man... Uh, I, I, well, here's what I liked. I, I liked the introduction of Rainer because the actor's really good, and I felt that it was the writer's room trolling the white male audience, saying like, hey, here's your, you know, moderately talented but not really great at any single one thing, middle manager who's good at managing people and getting the best out of them uh, character. Yeah, that hits me um, right here. <laughs> Yeah, look, he's going he's gonna to fail upwards. He, uh, you know, he, he gets fired, but somehow becomes the first officer of uh, Discovery. Uh, congratulations. Uh, the time travel episode was great. Uh, Discovery always does time travel really, really well, and popping back through, like, the history of their own show was really fun to watch. Um, yeah, but then... Uh, it's almost unforgivable to me that... In the third season in the 32nd century, as you were complaining earlier, Idol, 
that they're not visiting all the worlds that we know from Star Trek. Especially here when it's a treasure hunt where you're traveling between different worlds that these scientists are from mm. uh, that, that have been seeded by the progenitors with uh, the DNA that created us. Why why aren't we we it, we go to the whistle speak world that ha is created by denobulan technology instead of going to denobula the breen are our antagonists in the series but we don't go to the breen home world why why does that not happen it's it's a uh, you know we go to where do we go we go to trill which we've already been to we go to an abandoned planet that is, uh, for some reason, not the Arsenal of Freedom, but it has a series of defense <laughs> drones. Yeah. I, I, I don't know why they, they dropped the ball on that one. You know, we go to the Enterprise again, the ISS Enterprise. Mm. Uh, I, w I understand for budget reasons they just were reusing the Strange New World set, but golly, that, that really should be the TOS Enterprise set uh, for fun. You know, it should be the, the Star Trek VI Enterprise <laughs> In that episode. Visual kind of... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then we spend two episodes... Uh, we go to a library. Come on. And uh, <laughs> black, a black hole. <laughs> Fucking library. You know, Shy uh, hates libraries. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. I, I, I get it, nerds. I get it. You read a book. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> there's there's so many Chekhov's guns brought up in this series. Like, we, we get a data android for, like, 90 seconds. And that's it. We could have visited the planet of the androids. Where are the Sung, the Sung androids? Mm -hmm. You know, nothing, nothing. The pathway drive. So no one other than Ruan Tarka in the 32nd century can recreate uh, the navigation system for the Discovery uh, spore drive. Uh, that's that's just madness to me. Um, and then, and this is not the show, fault of the showrunners. The the having to cram the finale into the end of this this series is is just it's it's terrible it doesn't it does not stick the landing whatsoever i actually like seeing old burnham but the second you the second you use the saving private ryan morph into an old person into a young person thing you you failed as a filmmaker cuz steven spielberg taught us a lesson of what not to do at the end of saving private ryan you don't morph someone between their ages because it's terrible. It look it it it's, it was funny back then, and it's funny now. It 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 has no gravitas to it whatsoever. Um. So yeah, strong start to the season. Terrible ending. If this season had just been five of seven, I'd be fine with it because I would not have been forced to uh, lose contact with Detmer and Awoshakud and and Reese. Like, because they they were written off the show halfway through this series. Mm -hmm. Um, Went back to the home planet. Yeah, and if this is going to be the serious finale, you, you need to end with those characters. Mm. But and they would have probably gone out of their way to include them in more in the season. Um, and the biggest checkoff gun, of course, is the ISS Enterprise just being taken back to Starbase and not used <laughs> again. <laughs> it's going like, to be used in the Discovery sequel series thirty <laughs> years from now. Yeah, yeah. Like, what? Why? Why are Obo and Detmer not coming to the rescue in the? in the black hole against the that oh that ship design of the uh, the Breen capital ship is incredible it's, that whole black hole sequence but, is actually visually stunning yeah, like, that's one of my yeah, favorite oh, shots visually you know series. as yeah. always high high uh high uh is there, is there a little mousey behind me <laughs> <laughs> sorry there's a little mouse creepy route behind me um yeah, you mean a time high standard. <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> look you know, uh, any plot device to get us into time travel in in uh, Discovery is is fun. Is fun. Um, so yeah, I, I I was disappointed by season five. It's not Discovery down to third for me. Uh, but yeah, cranky. Uh, I agree with most of what you basically just said. Um, I was overall massively disappointed. Um, like you say, there is some very good parts, but the when they first show the storyline is going to be about the progenitors and they bring up the image on the computer that's from the next generation. At first, my first reaction was I sort of rolled my eyes and went, Oh, here we go. Stolen legitimacy again. Let's 
pull something out of the archives to make it look like Star Trek. Um, but I kind of got into that. I kind of got into it, and it, it started working for me. And then the Mall and Lock thing, I wasn't sure about it at first, but I kind of started getting into it. And then you get the backstory about halfway through the season of Mall and Lock and why they're doing what they're doing. And, and, you, and you start... I started getting into it quite a bit. Um, and then they kind of threw it into a black hole. And that's, that doesn't matter anymore. This is how we're going to end the show. And I just... I, it completely fell off a cliff at that point for me. They got the progen- they got the Burnhams in there talking to the progenitors. And they say, you know, we've chosen you and you're going to do this. And you're going to be the keeper of it. It bugged me a bit that they kind of went, oh, actually, it's not our technology. We just found yeah. it. <laughs> what? Oh no, that, that I didn't The whole mind, season, yeah. the whole season has been about the progenitor's tech, and then the progenitor goes, "Oh no, it's not hard." <laughs> what? And then Burnham obviously says, "Well, I've got this huge responsibility. Um, they've chosen me, no one else. Uh, let's throw it into the black hole and forget about it." Walt asks, "Did it jump um, the spot?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, yeah, yeah. I completely, I completely forgot about Maul and Locke. You, you get these once again. They do a great job of introducing new characters that are interesting, and they set mm. up this Romeo and Juliet uh, storyline with them, and somehow they they kill off. Yeah, well, <laughs> Locke kill kills them himself twice halfway through yeah. the series. Like, it's, yeah. like, like the death of one of them should have been the the catalytic event in the finale or the in the. Uh, you know, penultimate episode that maybe unified the Federation or made peace between the Breen and, and the human. But mm. it was it was a throwaway from a self-administered overdose. I mean, come on. And so, something that Idle picked up on as well, I saw when I was watching you guys do the dream about season five is they got, they're in the progenitor's tech and they've got, she pulls Locke out of the um, the transport, the, well, the buffer. And they put, she pulls his body out, and it's like, yes, they're going to bring him back. Oh no, we can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> what? Why you not? Can put triangles together and solve the secrets of the universe. That's, yeah, that's make a little about. puzzle. Yeah. Mm. I, I, I want to ask, since you brought it up, and some other people have brought it up, the whole we didn't find the technology, or, or we just found it, we didn't make it. Does that actually add anything to the story or make the progenitors more interesting? Because I'm curious why they went that way instead of well, just saying. Yes, we created it long ago, and but and and now here's your chance to be the stewards. I mean, it w- it would add something, I think, if we could get an, a a little additional bit of the story to say yes, it's been handed down from race to race, or it came from this galaxy, um, yeah. and this is how we acquired it. But they didn't; they just sort of went, "Oh yeah." It well, I I, I, I assume that in well in the presumed season six or seven, that they may have pulled on that thread a little bit more, maybe. But... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it, it cancels it cancels out the the whole premise of the progenitor. They were like yeah. we, we explored and we found we were alone in the universe and we basically yeah. died out from grief. But if they if they hit a point where they're like, "Oh no, other people existed before us." That gives them something to live for, something to explore, you know, something to look for, something to learn about themselves by studying the past. But no, they're, they're... it's something else that I was really hoping as well is Obviously, the progenitor episode in TNG is a well-known episode, and you've got was it Romulans, Klingons, humans, uh, all battling to get to this uh, to find this this they they find the hologram eventually, don't they? That tells them we seeded the universe. So why is the Breen the main? Why why haven't we got Romulans and Klingons with the Federation yeah, what's the doing? revisiting yeah. revisiting that whole thing? And the Breen, the Breen himself, I got a little bit annoyed with. All right, we we got told a new little bit of information about the Breen. They they exist in two states, is it like one sort of gelatinous weird state? Yeah, the real face and, and the, or, the, the, the 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 you know the not real face thing they did yeah. was quite cool. They did a little bit of cool lore drop in there. I, Why I didn't they explain that. it? I want, and now I was perfectly happy knowing that Breen come from an ice planet and they wear EV suits. I was perfectly happy, and they showed us a little bit of extra information about the Breen, and now I want to know more. I want to know why they're like that. How this works? Why? Yeah. Why tell us that little tiny bit extra when they're not going to show us the rest get of into it? Space, you, like... <laughs> you mean like maybe they could have gone to the Breen planet looking for a piece of the puzzle? <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, no, nah, don't do that. That's silly. Silly talk. Oh, God. 
Uh, audio, you're muted. Audio. 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 I think you're mited. <laughs> <laughs> just let your face do all the talking. You have such an expressive That's face. Fine. We'll, it just, we need to communicate with, like the 10C. Someone, someone let off some lights. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, no, it does add some times. I blame Discord. All right. Um, since we did so much in season five, I'm going to give you guys an option now. We have what, 30, 40 minutes maybe. We have a lot of talking points left. Do you want to keep talking about Discovery as a whole? We have tiering set up. Do you want to tier all the characters? Or should we wrap it up now and just uh, just do a quick hit on, on, on Discovery's legacy and and kind of put a bow on things? Where are you guys feeling? I, I feel like tiering could easily last about two hours, I think, with this yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we should, we should definitely tier them at some point. And of the remaining options, <laughs> where do you <laughs> land? All right, that's fine. Now, since I brought it up, let, let's go ahead and talk about that. Now, uh, Discovery's legacy going forward. You know, in, in all the prep, I, and I've watched almost all of it, and, and we break down everything, but I still can't get away from kind of what we started with early on, the, the fan reaction. Um how controversial it is you know and and even when we sit here and have this lovely discussion where we're all civil about it i still find it funny how some of us have one season ranked at the very bottom and and another Mm. person has it ranked like at the top so even even i think within itself it jumping around a thousand years in the future and all the back and forth you know it's 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 interesting to me that i hate to say but the division and and how polarizing it is is what's going to stick out to me? Um, I think when you I know. think about it in the future. But 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 where are you guys at? Time and is div- division is a is we, we should be banned. Okay, <laughs> but time <laughs> time will on. cure everything. Get, get I think to... <laughs> over over you know the next ten years you know like DS Nine DS Nine was not liked by the majority for a long time. You know people just going ah oh, it's not my Star Trek. It's it's you know uh, you know a set in space station. They didn't watch it, and then they came. A lot of people came back to DS Nine going actually. I really enjoyed this. Once you move past these online discussions that have happened, and once people start watching it without having to check like the recent, um, you know, discussion threads and being involved in that 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 circle and things like that, I think it will, it will it will come back around eventually, like all, all things do. And people say, yeah, it had its flaws. TNG had its flaws. You know, the discussions around on BBSs during TNG's first couple of seasons still echo today, but. Uh, at the end of the day, we still enjoy it for what it is. So I, 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 I think over time, these things, you know, the the big the bigotry will ev- evaporate for the, you know, and we'll focus on the other running Star Trek season where everyone so, hates. So it. what do you think Discovery's legacy will be rather than what it won't be? I think it's, I think it's more. We remember this, the Star Trek series that did something different, the Star Trek series that yeah. tried to evolve, and the Star Trek series that brought back star trek uh, because it did whether you liked it or not it brought back star trek and it was popular enough to grant us lots of spin-offs um it, it will be remembered as um the one that took chances the one that ha- is divisive uh, at some points but people will watch it and will remember it for those reasons more than say enterprise yeah the, the yeah toxic- i want to kind of oh, there you go the toxic fandom surrounding Discovery isn't caused by Discovery. It's a symptom of the culture war that we've been uh, slowly building up through for, for, for decades. So that will hopefully fade away or, you know, we'll be in a post-apocalyptic society at some point. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, this is the Wrath of Khan. This this relaunched Star Trek as a franchise, as a viable uh, uh, franchise in, in 26. There, you know, we had, we had, what, 10, 12-year hiatus? Aside from the Kelvinverse movies from from Star Trek on television, and th- this changed that. I think clearly for the better. Uh, yeah, I think it's daring. It's brave, diverse. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a it's a great legacy. Yeah, like I think it is a case of people are going to look back on this, and they're going to go. So you know, there was nothing, and we you know, like Star Trek killed itself in the end. Like Voyager was internally re- referred to as TNG season eight. Enterprise might as well have been Voyager season thirteen in terms of like it had a formula, it stuck to it, it did not deviate. 
and that inevitably led to just grinding them the, the same thing into the dirt just uh, do, does it matter if it's a you know, like the whole plating is down to 13% or does it matter if the shields are down to 13% and it's like they had moments of brilliance but they were all kind of just iterating on each other and then they, they you, know, you eat your own tail and you die um and then discovery for better or for worse said cool that's where they all went and it threw a dot and it hit somewhere on the board whether or not it hit a bullseye whether or not it hit double zero whether it hit off the board and hit someone that you love very dearly inside the head is up to your perspective right uh different seasons will hit different places on the dartboard but it's kind of incontrovertible that every single season every single show role that's come after it has had a baseline from which to work for and go where do we want to move in terms of where discovery went because strange new worlds is literally just season two blown outwards Picard is what if we like, you drill down really heavily on serialization and like pull really hard on the the legacy threads with the whole Sarek and Spock connection? What will people respond to that? Um, if we kind of dial back the you know, the legacy connection and go more of a sort of into the future with Prodigy and make it more of a kid show, will people respond to that? If we really drill in on the nostalgia. And go for a comedy. How to in as opposed to the dark and gritty. How people respond to that, and that's how you get lower there. So it's like if Discovery had just been TNG season twenty, I feel like it would have gotten a season, maybe two, and I don't think it would have. I don't think that all the track that we've gotten would be quite as different from each other as they are. Well, that's what the because let's be real. Yeah. Yeah, Orville strode to be that bridge, you know, to recreate Trek in a certain mm. way. And they literally got production designers to copy it the same kind of beats, the same kind of camera shots, the same kind of pans. And, you know, I like some of the Orville, but there is a reason, like, it, there are not a more than three seasons at the moment. Like, it has suffered from a bit of cancellation, but I think a lot of people are just like, well, yeah, we have seen this. Well, I, I wouldn't TNG. say the reason the Orville doesn't have seven seasons is because it's too much like TNG because it is it's more Galaxy Quest it started mm. as more Galaxy Quest that's what was presented I wouldn't say it's because it's too much like TNG well, third season why it very failed. much differs season from the three Galaxy. very much yeah. yeah season three they go hard and that kind of put me off with the Orville because of how much it's just like seasons. yeah because they, they, they couldn't decide the if they wanted to be a comedy or a straight sci-fi series yeah like yeah. well, Lord Dex commits I'm... to the comedy, right? Like they're like, mm. we're comedy, comedy yeah. first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's for a different conversation. Yeah, so. but it, it, it's one of those things where it's like TNG was essentially the same kind of thing. They threw a dart at the board, they hit a bullseye, and then they were like, "Cool, let's keep on trying to hit the bullseye." And it's like replicate it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's like you can't just keep on replicating the same thing. And even though I think in in a lot of ways Picard is a lot worse than Discovery. And I think in, in ways, Strange New Worlds is a lot better than Discovery. Um, it, it varies depending on the season and my mood and what I'm in the mood for. But if Discovery had not taken a lot of chances, I think we would have gotten less Star Trek, and I think it would have been less interesting, and it would have been less varied, and I don't think... like We're in a bit of a, oh, the franchise is in a little bit of danger, because, oh no, we're going down from like five shows to two or three. And it's like, that used to be really healthy back in the TNG thing. It used to be a case of TNG and DS9 right at the same time. Cool. Then it was uh, DS9 and Voyager at the same time. That used to be really, really healthy. And now we're, we're dialing back from five shows going almost at the same time. And it's like the show, the franchise is in a really good place right now. Like, and you kind of have to draw that line back to Discovery for all the steps that it got right and all the ones that got wrong. It, it gave you a blueprint. Hmm. I'm struggling to think of anything else to add to that, to be honest. Um, like you say, it, Discovery has a bit of everything, and it will, as far as I, I'm concerned, it will, it will go down as the series that revived Star Trek. Um, Star Trek can go anywhere now. They've tried because they've tried new things. Yeah. All right, they did. They weren't su necessarily successful with everything they did. Oh, yeah. But they tried something new, and they've put that thing, they that progressive thought into everyone's mind now, so they can maybe try and progress a little bit further in the future. Um, and there's and there's new fans now because of Discovery. There is a whole new generation of Star Trek fans that will push for their own Star Trek. 
because obviously this like Discovery and all new Trek is made by people who are fans of the TNG era Star Trek. Now you can have people that are fans of new Trek making their own Trek in the future. It's, it's just the cycle continuing. I mean, you, uh, you know, the Discovery will be known, like we talk about Progressive. It had a very happy gay couple in it. You know, they were yeah. compatible. They, it wasn't the forced, like, oh, we're just doing this because of gay inclusion. No, no, that was part, that that was central. It didn't feel, it, it didn't feel overly inclusive. It's like, yeah, they're a gay couple. It's natural in the show. They had a, you know, a, a non-binary person and a trans person in the show as, as well, just folded into the plot. Uh, in in a in a trans allegory plot and of, of all things as well like discovery is probably one of the most inclusive star trek has ever been mm. um problematic for some but fuck them this is great this is this is a great oh, even even in terms of even, even in terms of like not not just race gender uh, sexuality uh, anything like that it's progressive in that they've just tried they've thrown things at it they've just tried whole new things new concept um to see if it works, basically, yeah. and all right, yeah. some of it wasn't taken very well, but I think overall it's done a great job uh, of um, yeah. trying trying to move the the franchise onwards. Yeah, and I, I feel like it's it's given a lot of um, like, so so two points. Like it, it really just strikes me in season four watching like the Federation task force, and it was like Tarina, Rilek, Burnham, Harai, and Sru. It's like a lot of women, a lot of people of colour, like, just, like, a really diverse, interesting group, um, and just, like, so many strong female characters, it's like, guess what, we love TNG, but Crusher and Troy were done dirty most of the time. Mm. There's a reason why the the, the trope is a good Troy episode, because there are so many bad ones, because they were treated so badly by the narrative, and Discovery does not have that flaw at all, I would say. That is a flaw that is completely absent. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing. Um, okay. The other thing is, hold that... on, I, I gotta jump in there because, all right, the ending, the ending alone emphasizes how little the other characters matter. That they don't get a send off yeah. at all. And we've yeah. been begging for seven years. Give us another Owosakun episode. Give us another Det- Detmer episode. So, you know, you can argue that having a poor episode is worse, but getting the chance to have an episode at all counts for a lot and i think the other series did that way better than discovery mm. but see this mm. that your, your point proves how good those uh other those other characters are because that's why the the finale felt so empty because it didn't have those characters in it and that was yeah. because of the rush nature and shooting schedules and well, I think that's a series-long problem, though. I... The, whole, the whole second half of the series didn't have most of those characters in. Mm. You mean the season? I know we have different names for season. <laughs> yeah, sorry. See, yeah, okay. Yeah. Right, we're we're going to ban the Brits next time. It'll just be Dan, Shy, <laughs> me. And... That's fine. I can get some sleep. Um, but the other point I want to bring up is that if for all we've been ragging on how undeveloped the 32nd century is, we know so much more about the latter end of the timeline now and it's like yeah in TNG like you learn quite a bit about certain parts you learn about the Klingons you learn a bit about the Romulans you learn a bit about the Cardassians and then DS9 takes the Romulans and runs and then suddenly it's the backbone of the entire show and Discovery takes so many wild swings with we're gonna have the the season's wife antagonist is the Orions and now Mm. it's the Breen and here's a rising scientist who is our antagonist and here is just like all these different things and like yeah didn't all land but it's always possible for another show to run up and pick that up like mm. the star trek uh star Trek academy show is going to be a natural sequel to that. and for all we know that will capitalize on the things that were dropped here and retroactively improve it like i find that that's the case a lot with like with tng and tos that you go back and you watch it and you go you have an affection for it now because you've had so many things built on top of that foundation. Like that's the the wonderful thing about having a legacy franchise is that you get to build on what came before, and then you go back to the original and you go, "Wow, yeah, no, they they they, they had no idea what was going to happen six years in the future." But looking back, it's really really like awesome to see the foundation of it. Um, and it's like we could have thirty second century shows. We could have an entire show about like the temporal wars and how fucked up that got. Like mm. there's so many like little details and so many strings you can pull on now and a baseline, and especially if you consider how 
much people were going on at like Discovery for, oh, it's just prequel after prequel after prequel. We're not moving out the 24th century. It's like, cool, fuck it. We're in the 32nd century. It's like, <laughs> okay, cool. Just go. Just go wild. Do whatever the fuck you want. And they sell guess what? We haven't learned anything about the Klingons. <laughs> that is cool. That is cool. <laughs> but hey, we don't know anything yeah, about Klingons. Yeah, then you've got to reattach them, though. Why have we heard anything about Klingons? Like, hmm. yeah. Why have we heard anything about Klingons? That's an entire thing. That, like, that could be the backbone of the Starfleet Academy season one thing, and it could have mm. Professor Joanna Wishakun as like you know, like, and it could have all of these things. It could. There's no reason. Yeah, you know, I'm going to quote the other series, and I'm going to use this awful quote that has such bad connotations now. Nobody's ever really gone in Star Trek. You can always come back to these things. Um, so I'm and, just, like, I'm just imagining know. now, I, like uh, uh, Oo and Detmer in a class, and they're just like, right. Now, if you're on the bridge, and here's how you give a good reaction shot, you have to time it just right. So you to <laughs> see how that was done. You see how that was done. <laughs> but look how far we've come from them just using the same stock footage of Sulu looking back over his shoulder in the view screen. <laughs> look, they saved oh, so dear. much money from that Shia. Right? I know. So I much know. money. Um, but yeah, it's like you, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, and the Discovery took a lot of shots, and I feel like you know, if we're talking about legacy, then twenty years down the line, people might be talking about what we learned about the Breen or the Orions here, the same way that we talk about some of the Klingon episodes in TNG. You don't know. Oh, it's definitely. all a case of what hmm. by building on the foundation of what came on before. And it's like that's inevitably gonna change how you view these seasons in retrospect. And I'm really hmm. curious to see who picks up the baton and goes with it next. Yeah. yeah, Starfleet Academy is the obvious outlet for that, right? Because you have everyone mm. coming to be in in the school. It will be, you know, it'll be, uh, you know, ho space Hogwarts, and uh, Paul, <laughs> oh, no. Paul, G Paul Giamatti will be uh, the defense of the dark sciences teacher. <laughs> <laughs> is Kovic going to be headmaster? Oh. Mm. No, I feel like he's like the mysterious person you see talking to. Headmaster Tilly or whatever, and in the episode one, and he comes back in the end of the season. So. Are you yeah, saying Kovic is Dumbledore? He is. He's like the <laughs> area inspector. He goes around the, each of the different academies. No. Oh, he'll sure be dressed up as, as a janitor, and you'll just see like a shot of him in the background somewhere, <laughs> silently puppeteering everything. All right, fellas. They're gonna uh, make if you it... think about, yeah, if you think about the, the possible cast that they could pull in for references in season in like a Stop It Academy show set in the 32nd century, there's a lot of pulls. There's a lot of people you could pull in. It'd be cool. I'd be down for it. They should make it a parody of like a lame magic school bus thing where they travel back in time to different <laughs> histories of Star Trek to teach a lesson to the <laughs> to the classes. Actually, you joke, but Tilly is missing. You'd watch that. Like, the most perfect casting. That's true, actually. That's true. You're right. Hi, kids. These guys are called the Wadi. <laughs> you want to see their game? <laughs> oh. oh, God. Dare you. <laughs> All right. Uh, are you going to move us on there, Arm uh, Well, I am very hungry, so I'm going to call it here. But I'm going to give you guys a chance. Uh, any last thoughts about Discovery before I unplug the computer? Okay, look. Discovery's had its. It, it, it's, it, it, we are done now. It's had its moment in history for anyone watching that was not a fan and you didn't like it. That's great. You don't have to like everything. And I think we've entered an era now of Star Trek that is. Uh, a, a little piece for everyone there is a there is an animated comedy that I know my dad would absolutely hate but I absolutely adore Lower Decks I know Discovery is the serialised experimental storytelling thing that's focused around a main character and for some that worked for some that didn't um, Star Trek is taking bold new bold new moves and uh, being suffer, suffering at the hands of corporate decisions as well um, I think Discovery has a legacy uh, of something that was bold that went to do its place that had an online discourse but is not the only show to have done that so it is it is not alone it can join um, all the other shows that try to do something different as well um, so yeah no, I, I, I Discovery's not my favourite series um, it, ne it never will mm. be season 4 is but um, it, I appreciate Discovery for bringing Trek new frontiers which is kind of the idea really mm-hmm yeah, I think cranky I have to agree. Like, Discovery is not going to be <laughs> cranky agrees. <laughs> yep. Guess what? If cranky agrees, you're probably saying something right. Um, yeah, Discovery is not my favorite. Like, I, I I like it a lot. I like certain characters in it, like a massive amount. 
season four has jumped so high in my estimation. Um, and I think it'll probably age quite well. Um, some parts of it won't. Uh, maybe I'll rewatch that season five and come, you know what, that fucking episode I was garbage after all. Um, especially if that, you know, Starfleet Academy show doesn't give me what I want, which is more development of those characters. That's entirely possible. Um, it's entirely possible thing for age to age badly. But in the end, it's a case of, I also have to think about this is also a show not made just for me as a Star Trek fan, but it's also a case of this is a show also for like people like who look like Burnham, who look like Booker, who look like who look like Wilson Cruz. It's like it's fair like, for those people as well. And how I many can't... people look like Wilson Cruz though? Uh, not too many. Oh god. <laughs> well, hold on here. Oh no. Forgot to go to the gym. This um, <laughs> and it's like I I can't I can't speak to their experience. Obviously, I can speak to how much you know, like Adira and Gray and. Samets and Kolba spoke to my experience um, and my boyfriend's experience and how special that was to me that Trek recognized me um, and I hope that they felt the same way that it's like no I'm finally given my dues in a show that promises that everyone is equal um, and yeah didn't do it perfectly but in the end it did it well enough for me it's sort of piggyback on that I'll, I'll give my final thoughts here the jerry springer's final thoughts uh we are 41 minutes away from my local wnba team play and i'm gonna tune in for that so um <laughs> I, i'm not sure whether whether to to praise shy for continuing to frequent those forms of online discourse or not but i would just say to, to try to keep in mind the person on the other side of the screen because they may be a bigot or they may be like me who was a bigot who's willing to learn and grow. And if, you know, we want to talk about the beauty of Trek and the inclusion and the progressiveness and you want to get there eventually, well, then try to bring your fellow men alongside and, and get there together. Otherwise, we'll be stuck in some mirror universe where everything's ugly as hell. So, Shai, uh, I'm sure you can say that much more eloquently than I. What are your final thoughts here on Discovery? I mean, I, I love Discovery. You know, it's still my third favorite series. And uh, there, the... You know, the litmus test for Star Trek series, because we came up in such a period of Star Trek scarcity for for decades, you know, in the... in The um, dark times. The ability to re-watch a series is, is paramount for me, no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> I will have TNG just playing in the background, and I've just put Discovery on playing from season one all the way through uh, many, many times, and it, it's very rewatchable for me. And it cannot be overstated, as you as you touched on, Stars, how important it is when you're trying to expand an audience for them to be able to see themselves on the screen. Uh, having uh, Cynic with Martin Green, Wilson Cruz, uh, all those actors, and Michelle Yeoh uh, there, who, you know, and this series kind of reintroduced her to Hollywood a little bit, and that led to everything, everywhere, all at once, which Great. led to you know, Ki Hu Kwan's return to to Hollywood after twenty, thirty years and winning an Oscar, and you know, I, I that that caused me to just cry that night that that happened. So, that's uh, Discovery's legacy. They brought him back. Yeah, they, they <laughs> it's that little domino back. meme of like Brian, <laughs> Brian Fuller writing a a. a, a a pitch meeting for for discovery and then at the end it's just the oscar for every everything everywhere all at once so that's the it, last you know, domino effect it it is a domino effect it, it's um so it's it's very important for me as a series and it's uh important i think for everyone and you know as as you were saying Otto, yeah i that was my one of one of the things i compliment the cast on they're always inviting and welcoming and and loving towards fans who just Spew hate it. Uh, mm. You know, I, you you mentioned Doctor Who uh, stars. You know, the new Doctor and, and Shudi Gatwa. There's an episode mm. of this his first season where he's yeah. on a planet mm. of bigots, and they're just like, "We want nothing to do with you." Not and he's well. still like, "You don't have to do anything with me after this. Just let me save you. Just let me save you." And they refuse, and crying. Even though they hate him, he, he just wants to save them, and and that's 
that's what Star Trek is. You know, even if you hate what they're doing, Star Trek is trying to save you, kids. Uh, <laughs> just, just let it do its work. Come back. Show your soul. Same with the Acolyte. Calm down, kids. <laughs> All right. On that note, we will conclude our <laughs> six Cranky, did you? Of, of the description. Star Trek. I, I, okay. I thought the <laughs> nod was his was his tacit approval of everything we've done. Yeah. No. Discovery. Is, Discovery is fine. It's, it's a great series. <laughs> it's done good stuff. It's all right. It's okay. It's, it's all right. <laughs> nah. It's uh, yeah. No. You guys have said you've stolen all the good answers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's great. It's it's opened opened the books. I don't know if that's the right phrase. If that's even a phrase for so much more stuff to come. You can indeed open a book. <laughs> you can open a book. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem podcasting with these three cranky because they're so you know eloquent and astute and uh, smart. <laughs> they just take they, all, they the take good all the good points. They take <laughs> all the good answers. You gotta jump in. You gotta jump in. You know, you, you can't just wait for Idol's fifth uh, commentary on that subject. You gotta get in between one and two for two and three. I had a whole monologue written out, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to hear these two talk even more, this Sunday, Butter Zone, they're gonna be tearing X-Men characters. Da -da 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 -da. Talking about how to survive in a post-discovery world. So tune in for that. Thank you, Dan, Nifty, not Nifty, yes, Nifty last week. Cranky, shy. Thank me. Always Nifty. Uh, and auto. Thank you, Otto. I appreciate yeah. you Idol. hosting this. You did a great job. It it I think it all went a little uh nicer than I would have expected, considering <laughs> how, how rocky those the discourse has been over the years. But and yeah, and if if for whatever reason you've gone through six you gotta sell it. You gotta sell it. Come on. <laughs> all right. Tune in Sunday. That's all we have for you today. Live long and prosper. <laughs> Live long and prosper. All Let's all set. I got Hooker lined up with a dude who's gonna give him the deal of a lifetime in a new Porsche. A Porsche. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you should wait. You might get a better deal through the state. Yeah? Yeah, we just did some story on a guy who's selling stolen Porsches off a lot on Maine. Real sleazy character. What's his name? Um, Delvin, Kelvin, um... Uh, Melvin? Melvin? <laughs>